call the Committee for Law Amendments to order, please. Just uh, welcome uh, this afternoon a couple of housekeeping matters. Uh, washrooms for public use are located uh, outside and downstairs uh, on the main level as you're going down the stairs to the left-hand side. Uh, those who would have cell phones, if you could turn them to silent mode, and if necessary, uh, feel free to exit the room to take calls. And as presenters come forward, uh, I would ask you to identify yourselves and uh, those uh, who you would be representing. Speakers will have, presenters will have an opportunity to speak for 10 minutes and uh, members of committee have an opportunity to respond with questions for a period of five minutes. And we will give you, although some take exception to it, but to your benefit and to your, for your advantage, we will give you a notice uh, at about two minutes. So you, at least you're in the frame of mind to frame up your comments uh, and capture the essence of, uh, of your presentation. So with that, uh, Bill 58, the Municipal Government Act and Halifax Regional Municipality Charter uh, the first presenter, Mr. Nathan Rogers. Yes, if I can ask uh, members of the... Come to the uh, table, Mr. Rogers. If I can ask members of the committee uh, to identify themselves, and we'll start here on my right. Tammy Martin, MLA Cape Breton Centre. Gary Burrell, MLA Halifax Shabucto. Brad Johns, MLA, Sackville Beaver Bank. Bonjour, bienvenue. My name is Chris Tontremont of the MLA for Argyle Barrington. That was new. Oh, Gordon Hebb, Councils of the Committee. <laughs> Mark Fury, I'm the chair and uh, MLA for Lunenburg West. And Karen Kenley, Assistant Clerk. Keith Irving, MLA, King South. Rafa Di Costanzo, MLA Clayton Park West. Good afternoon, Suzanne Lonis Croft, MLA Lunenburg. Brendan McGuire, good afternoon, Halifax Atlantic. Thank you, folks. Uh, Mr. Rogers, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. This is the song. Okay. Thank you very much, Nathan Rogers. Halifax. I'm here on behalf of the Licensed Professional Planners Association of Nova Scotia, often referred to as the acronym LPANS. LPANS exists under the Professional Planners Act of Nova Scotia. Really, we have two main purposes of that act. It is firstly uh, to regulate the profession of, of planning. And secondly, that is to recognize the practice of professional planning. And what I'd like to do today is just compare and contrast, or maybe not so much contrast, but compare the Bill 58, which is before you, and the objectives of LPANS, which exists under the Professional Planners Act. I'm gonna choose three main topics um, that are pulled from our act, in which we employ on a regular basis. Uh, and I'll just clarify one point. As president of LPANS, I'm the chair of our board, and represent approximately 200 members across the province to undertaking professional planning. So back to the objectives of the Act. First point I want to note is that our objective is to improve the quality of the environment in Nova Scotia, as well as communities in Nova Scotia. The, the Bill 58 intends to do the same by enabling planning documents, that being municipal planning strategies and subsequent land use bylaws, to be consistent uh, across Nova Scotia. Today, we're in a situation where we have a number of municipalities, municipal jurisdictions that don't have planning. And from the perspective of LPANS, consistent uh, planning and regulation is important to improve quality and environment of our communities. Secondly, I want to talk about our objective of particip uh, uh, participation and cooperation among different parties with regards to uh, planning matters. 
Bill 58 proposes the same type of approach, where consultation is required between municipal units on, on matters that are of like um, importance. Take, for example, floodplains. Floodplains and the rivers associated with them do not adhere to municipal boundaries. Rather, it's quite obvious in some regards that they pass municipal boundaries. So engagement and consultation between municipalities is, actually, is, a, is paramount to the success of protecting our environment and creating cooperation between municipal jurisdictions. There, there would be some trepidation probably on this regard, given the impact of uh, uh, requiring to consult across jurisdictions, but through uh, pr provisions uh, the municipalities can put together and uh, engagement with their professional, professional planners and councils, that can be achieved. Um, the third point uh, that I want to raise regards to the Professional Planners Act is protecting the interests of the public. And Consistent and appropriate missile planning strategies that will be enabled through Bill 58 really assists in protecting the interests of the public. Again, I'll turn back to flooding and a known issue which is relevant to us all, climate change. The adoption of Bill 58 will set the table for all municipalities across the province to adhere to uh, the, the uh, provincial interest statements, statements of provincial interest, in particular flood risk, risk area. I'll just note a provision of the existing statement of provincial interest. Planning documents must identify flood risk areas consistent with the Canada Nova Scotia Flood Damage Reduction Program mapping in any locally known floodplain. The key to that provision is the first three words. Planning documents must. In the case of municipal jurisdictions that don't have planning documents, there's no requirement to adhere to the floodplain uh, uh, provisions of the uh, statement of provincial interest. And this is furthermore important with the province's uh, intended coastal protection legislation. It's possible, I only speak on, on a possibility at this point, but it's possible that the, the coastal protection legislation could, um, could also consist of a statement of provincial interest. And if we are going to have a consistent uh, approach to how we manage our coasts, in, especially in Nova Scotia, then consistent application at the municipal level is absolutely important. I'll finish by saying that uh, LPANS uh, firmly believes that nobody does anything alone. So cooperation amongst municipalities in the province can continue. And we look forward, our 200 plus members that work for municipalities, work for the province, work for private sector or not-for-profits are ready to respond uh, once this bill is passed and ensure that uh, we can take a, a uh, professional and uh, positive approach. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Rogers. Questions? Mr. Burrell. Uh, well, thanks for this explanation. Uh, I'm just wondering about thinking about the uh, the municipalities that presently are in the state of situation of not having planning, and the and the requirement through the bill uh, that they move into a planning situation, uh, does uh, does Alpans have any uh, thought about uh, some of the financial considerations about this, or possible need for extended provincial support towards those municipalities in order to make that possible? Mm. Absolutely. There will be a financial requirement, uh, you could say a burden on Ms. Pally's to undertake this, that being staff resources mm -hmm. or hiring third parties to undertake the uh, required engagement and yeah. ultimately adopting planning documents. So I, I'm not deep into the incentive yeah. on financial portion of this, but certainly uh, we do recognize the, the costs associated with it. But in, in many regards, um, the cost associated with undertaking planning documents is minimal to the, to the uh, economic yeah. development as well yeah. as uh, health implications that uh, planning can, can uh, achieve. Yeah, totally. Thank you. 
Thank you, Mr. Rogers. No further questions. Thank you for your comments today. Thank you very much. Mayor Jeff Cantwell from the town of Wolfville. Mr. Chair. Welcome. Mem members of the committee. My hometown MLA. Oh, he's an MLA. He's the best one I have. That I can tell you. <laughs> anyway, committee members, thank you for the opportunity to, uh, to address this, uh, to address you at the Law Amendments Committee. My name is Jeff Cantwell, Mayor of the Town of Wolfville. I'm a member of the board of the Nova Scotia Federation of Municipalities and chair of the town's caucus. I am extending regrets on behalf of the president of the uh, NSFM, Councillor Jeff Stewart, who cannot be here with us today. He is attending a meeting in Port Hawkesbury uh, with respect to resolutions to be presented at the, uh, at the annual general meeting uh, in November. The Nova Scotia Federation of Municipalities is the voice of Nova Scotia municipalities. On behalf of my board and our members, I wish to speak in support of Bill 58 concerning minimum standards for land use planning across Nova Scotia's 50 municipalities. Our members raised this subject as a concern in our town's task force report of 2011. The task force thought it was important. Oops. Mr. Irving. The letter presentation that you're making right now appears to be regarding Bill 55, according to its title. Oh, really? And I should have put these. Th you're, you're presenting yes. twice, as I understand it. So I am. I'm sorry. Me, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm terribly sorry. Yeah. Okay. Don't. If you're having difficulty following, thanks, man. Now I better get to the right one here again. All right. Okay, and rather than begin over, uh, I'll continue where I was uh, after my identification. Uh, our members raised this subject as a concern in our town's task force report of 2011. The task force thought it was important for adjacent municipalities to consult with one another when making land use plans near municipal boundaries and wanted to pave the way for more meaningful intermunicipal planning and their agreements. They saw these goals as being important enough to warrant creating or amending legislation. These were recommendations of the town's task force. As a number of our rural municipalities do not do comprehensive planning now, establishing minimum planning standards is an important step towards regional planning. The statements of provincial interest are important and addressing them through planning will be beneficial to all Nova Scotians. I would also note the NSFM also passed a resolution in 2017 on economic development, calling for incentives to encourage regional land use planning as a means of encouraging economic growth. NSFM was pleased to see the Department of Municipal Affairs undertake consultation on the potential for minimum planning this summer. Municipal elected officials and municipal staff who could not attend these meetings were invited to provide feedback in written or electronic form. The bill resulting from these consultations and efforts will help communities work together to plan more sustainable futures, especially in the face of increasing infrastructure expenses and climate change. The bill will help to make local government more effective and efficient, encourage meaningful strategic interaction between communities and councils and improve the everyday lives of citizens as they move about our municipalities. We are pleased to see our members' long-standing concerns reflected in the wording and passages of this bill. It addresses many municipal planning concerns and we believe it will help enable effective local government and the building of sustainable communities. For these reasons, we stand firmly in support of this bill. 
Furthermore, the Nova Scotia Federation of Municipalities and our members look forward to working with the province in developing the regulations to support this bill. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Cantwell. Questions? Yes. In, if not, I might, just to jump to Mr. Burrell's comment earlier uh, with respect to resources and so on, we do expect there will come, uh, there will, it will be required for education or resources, uh, yes, that'll be, that'll certainly be incumbent upon uh, any new legislation. And it, it's going to take time, however, there, there is lots of experience out there in this, uh, in this field. And um, today, it was mentioned uh, by Mr. Rogers um, about improving environments. Uh, those environments, not only floodplains, and there is, a, as mentioned, the economic development. Business doesn't know borders either, and uh, for us to restrict them like that, it's, it seems unfair. So uh, is there a burden on, on, on municipal units? There's so many other units that have it. The sharing of those resources should mitigate any uh, costs that would prove to be uh, a burden. Thank you, Mr. Cantwell. Thank you. We will uh, hold Bill 58. We have presenters uh, later in the day and move to Bill 49, uh, the Gaming Control Act. So I'm led to believe that Mr. Traves is actually here. We're ahead of schedule, believe it or not, so uh, instead of having Mr. Traves wait till the end of the day, we'd be more than pleased to accommodate his presence at this time. Welcome. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair, much appreciated. <laughs> Uh, Mr. Chair, members of the committee, uh, I'm John Traves. I am the uh, Director of Legal, Municipal Clerk and External Affairs for uh, HRM, which is a fancy way of saying the Municipal Solicitor, and um, allow my colleague to introduce herself. Yes, I'm, uh, I'm Kelly Denty, uh, Director of Planning for that we need our guest mic turned on. There we go. Thank you. That's better. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, Kelly Denty, HRM uh, Planning and uh, Development Director. Um, Mr. Chair, members of the committee, uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to present uh, to you today on this important issue. Land use planning is a key municipal responsibility, and HRM supports a move to ensure municipalities have comprehensive land use policies in place. However, we have uh, some concerns about the approach this legislation takes. The Department of Municipal Affairs consulted on proposed amendments during the summer. The information shared at that time was relatively high level and spoke to general land use planning requirements and intermunicipal consultation. At that time, HRM provided feedback indicating our support for these two concepts, but noting concerns about the legislation being overly prescriptive. Bill 58, however, proposes using ministerial regulation ra instead of, or rather than, legislation to establish minimum planning requirements and consultation processes between municipalities. Municipalities have no influence or authority over the adoption of regulations, as you know. Ministerial regulations are not captured by the Charter's uh, statutory duty to consult with municipalities. This direction could have the effect of requirements being imposed on HRM and other municipalities that are not capable of being achieved, or worse, changing requirements during ongoing planning processes. The use of regulation in this form for planning matters, in our view, runs contrary to the goal of planning being a transparent and participatory decision-making process. The legislation also allows the minister to impose financial penalties in cases where minimum planning requirements are not fulfilled by withholding grants and other funding. Withholding funds appears to us to be an excessive way to achieve minimum planning requirements in all municipalities. Given that many minimum planning requirements are to be prescribed by regulation, 
which may change without notice or municipal involvement, it also leaves us in a potential situation where we may be unable to meet minimum requirements and thus subject to financial penalties. In 1984, in Council's original direction relating to uh, the need for an HRM charter review, HRM was clear in terms of what has sought in terms of a new charter. And it was defined at that time by Council and remains the case that HRM is looking to re for the recognition of the maturity of HRM, that any charter change be strategically focused, be permissive in nature, provide increased legislative autonomy, and provide increased financial autonomy. Legislative amendments that see such a significant delegation of authority to the Minister over municipal planning matters runs counter to this request and direction from Council. HRM, to be clear, has already adopted a comprehensive set of official planning documents, some would argue too comprehensive, uh, that cover the entire municipality. Our understanding from provincial staff is that the intent of the legislation here in front of you today is to require those municipalities who have not yet adopted plans to do so. As a consequence, HRM's request is that the amendments to the HRM Charter be removed from the bill and that efforts be focused on a new HRM Charter that has previously been requested, failing which we would request that the matter be deferred pending amendments that respond to our concerns. Thank you very much for the opportunity to speak. Uh, is it possible, Mr. Trace, to uh, obtain a copy of your presentation? Certainly. I, I have the base. I have added a little bit, and but I will provide that. Certainly. Thank yeah. you very much. My pleasure. Questions? Mr. McGuire. Thank you for uh, coming here today. So I just want to uh, kind of wrap this all up and uh, see if I understand. Uh, you correctly, Mr. Traves. So when you say when it comes to planning, um, and we're talking about HRM in particular, uh, what you're looking for is obviously um, autonomy to be able to make your own decisions um, and uh, to show that the city is a mature city and can act on its own uh, without be, have, uh, having um, planning, I guess, shoved down your throat. Uh, and you, you have gone through a comp comprehensive planning when it comes to HRM. Um, and, and I guess what you're, you're saying here is you know what's right um, and, and you don't want almost big brother looking over your shoulders and telling you what to do. Uh, Mr. Maybe Chairman. I'm oversimplifying that. But. <laughs> I, Mr. Chairman, I, I, I think it would be more fair to say that um, a, a strong legislative uh, framework is important. We recognize that. We also recognize that there is a distinction between HRM, and that's reflected in having a separate charter, and the Municipal Government Act. And that as a, as a situation of that, and I'll, I'll be very brief, as a consequence of that, we don't take any issue with the need for intermissible consultation. We agree with it. I think that our position is it would be better reflected in the legislation rather than in the hands of departmental staff and the minister through, regu re through regulation. It's that uncertainty that gives us some concern. So, so you believe that HRM um, should have uh, the ability to plan their own infrastructure, decide what areas have growth, what areas don't. Um, am I right in, in, in saying that? Yeah, yeah we do now. So, yes. the, so the reason I ask this is I recently received a letter from City Council um, in regards to uh, infrastructure, uh, and so I'm confused right now. Uh, you're saying this now, and the letter that I received from City Council said, well, we don't want that infrastructure but go ahead and do it if you want. You have the ability right. and you should do it if you want to do it. So there, on, on, on one side I'm hearing uh, from people that are in pretty high authority right. within HRM saying, wait a second, we want autonomy, this is our city, we know how to run the city, we don't need Big Brother. And right. then when difficult decisions, decisions that maybe they don't want to have made, right. they're passing it over and saying, well, go ahead and do it. Right. So which is it? So there's 
two issues at play. One is here, we're here today talking about uh, regulations and legislation around planning as distinct from infrastructure. But in the question well, of... Well, planning plays but, into infrastructure but, well, planning are all part of... But with, with respect, we're here today talking about this bill. In terms of infrastructure, certainly council is free to make decisions. And I think what you're seeing in terms of, in particular, uh, the extension of water and sewer services is a question as to whether it fits within the municipal planning strategy of the day. And if it does not, recognizing that it may be then up to a higher power or a different power of government to extend those services if they so choose. And so that, that essentially is a factual response. So, my last thank you, Mr. <laughs> McGuire. Right. Mr. Johns. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. I don't, uh, I don't see how uh, infrastructure and planning, I understand that they are hand in hand, but I see requesting funds from the province for projects and uh, what's being asked for here. I see those as two totally separate things. Other than uh, the consultation with uh, adjacent municipalities, which uh, from my experience uh, HRM has done in the past on their own, is there anything in the bill that you see that HRM is not currently already doing? I can, I can take that question. Uh, there really isn't anything in the bill that we're not already doing. That, that is our point, uh, that we do have comprehensive planning in place. Our concern is with the, the unknown of the regulations. Yeah. So it suggests that minimum planning regulations will be determined by the minister. We feel that could be a bit of a moving target with a number of processes that we have in place right now. Yeah. So in essence, it's the regulation, not the substance of what's to be achieved. Um, if I could, so Mr. Traves do you, or Ms. Denty, do you think that uh, Halifax Regional Council, in lieu of the fact that I would assume that this would be something that would be coming forward in a future request for charter changes, but in lieu of that is Council, or do you think Council would be agreeable to providing the province uh, with, you know, a little letter or an MOU of some type saying that they will uh, consult other municipalities when appropriate? Uh, we, uh, we currently consult other municipalities now. Mm. Um, we would continue to do so for, for matters that cross our borders. We would have no center policies. center policies as well, of course. Yeah. And so just so if I do make a motion here at the, uh, at the end of this, so it's to remove the amendments. Uh, I, I missed what you said at the very, uh, the very last uh, sentence you said there, Mr. Traves. So it's to remove the amendments from the HRM charter and request that there be an updated charter for HRM? Uh, I think it's essentially the first portion, which is to remove the amendments in Bill 58 that apply to the, to the HRM charter. The, the request on a new charter is already outstanding in any event. All right, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Trace. Mr. Irvin. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chair. So uh, just so that, that I'm clear on what you're saying here is there's nothing in this bill that is not what you're doing already. Uh, you're concerned th that regulations, uh, you're concerned about consultation during regulations is I think your main point. Do you not see that there is merit in having a bill that treats uh, uh, processes equally amongst all municipalities, and this is really just bringing in uh, some consistency between right. the other 49 municipalities right. and HRM in terms of the gui guiding legislation right. around planning. Uh, Mr. Chair, through you to the member. Um, no, essentially the challenge with this bill is that it, it establishes a framework by which the minister can bring in any number of different regulations, and our concern is what those regulations may entail. I think with with consultation and seeing you know what is on the, what is on the table with respect to a, le a legislative amendment um, that brings that in evenly for all municipalities, we would likely not have an objection subject to being consulted on it. It's the fear of the unknown and and the reality of of HRM being in a situation where we have a, a very large planning staff, a large number of planning um, documentation in place already, and the concern that there is there is a certainty around all of that process, which then gets upset, where you have the potential for new regulations, which may come at some point. We, we understand how they work, and they do not have the same level of rigor as something that comes in front of even this body to be reviewed. Thank you. 
Any further questions? Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Would Mr. Olton or Mr. Vissers be present? So we will refer this bill to um, later in the afternoon when our presenters are here. And at this time, uh, move to Bill 49, the Gaming Control Act. Our first presenter, uh, Sue Burge. And correct me if I mispronounced your surname, please. That was the correct pronunciation, thank you. Welcome. Thank you. Um, I'm Sue Burge. I am the Director of Standards and Accreditation with the Responsible Gambling Council in Toronto. And um, I'm here to speak about the amendments to the Gaming Control Act, and I appreciate the opportunity to, to address this body. Um, in 2016, um, we were invited to come and conduct an accreditation, uh, basically an in-depth review of the responsible gambling program in place uh, at the two casinos in uh, Nova Scotia and Halifax and Sydney. And I was part of that um, process at that time. So I thought what I'd do is start off with a bit of a description about the, pro uh, the program itself and then talk a bit about some of the results we, we found as part of our audit. Uh, so the, the RG Check is the name of the program. It was developed by the Responsible Ga Gambling Council of Canada in 2010. Uh, purpose is to support gaming operators in the adoption of meaningful responsible gambling initiatives and evaluate those initiatives against measurable evidence-informed standards. So we want to make sure it's working, what the things that are in place are actually doing something. Uh, this program is recognized um, by regulators and operators as one of the most rigorous in the world. Um, and it's based on a comprehensive set of standards uh, that essentially were designed to meet or exceed regulatory requirements. So in fact, we try to go a bit further than most um, governments in terms of the regulations they, they have in place. Uh, there are eight standards. Um, and essentially what they cover are responsible gambling policies, employee training, voluntary self-exclusion, assisting patrons who may need help, informed decision-making, advertising and promotion, access to money, so this would include things like credit and so on, and venue and game features. So those, that's the scope of what we look at. Uh, we have hundreds of metrics that we use to compare uh, and measure the effectiveness of these programs against. Uh, to date, we've completed about 150 such accreditations um, all across Canada and then Singapore. Uh, we've also used these standards to review and assess lottery, horse racing, and VLT programs uh, in Australia, the UK, and elsewhere. So they are internationally uh, applied. Uh, so the process that we use, it's a structured process. It's much like an, a financial audit would be, in a sense. Um, it starts with data, data gathering. Uh, we do a review of uh, basically policies and procedures that are in place at casinos. We then conduct a physical review of the site, so we actually go and visit the casinos. We spend a couple of days uh, taking a look at the site. We interview key staff. We conduct uh, staff surveys, um, anonymous staff surveys. We also survey patrons, so customers. We talk to them about responsible gambling policies and procedures in place. And we ask for a uh, demonstration of the voluntary self-exclusion process when we're on site. We then look at all, these, all this data that we've gathered and uh, we look at things like senior staff commitment to responsible gambling and a whole series of other measures. Uh, then we go back, we, we develop our report, um, and we, which includes a series of recommendations. So it's broken into eight sections based on the standards, and we have recommendations in each of those areas. And uh, which, like any other audit process, we submit a draft report to the casino. Uh, we go uh, back and forth a little bit to talk about any gaps or misrepresentations or whatever, and then we submit that final report to an independent accreditation panel. And uh, we have a national body of experts and uh, we go through a process with them where they ask questions, they poke and prod a little bit, and once that process is complete to everyone's satisfaction, we would go ahead and accredit the casinos. 
uh, the accreditation period is for three years, and there is a requirement for an annual update to be submitted uh, each year just to provide any changes to the program that may have happened over that 12 months. So that's the process. Um, our findings specifically for Nova Scotia, um, as I mentioned, we conducted this review in March of 2016. It wrapped up in August of that year, so it was about a four-month process. Uh, across all standards, both casinos scored well, uh, with the exception of the voluntary self-exclusion program. Um, I should say that um, in order to, to receive accreditation, you must achieve 70% or greater overall, and each standard must achieve a 50% minimum. Uh, the seven of the eight standards did well. Uh, Self-exclusion barely passed at Halifax. It came in at 58%, which is very low for this program and Sydney came in at 65%. So clearly there are a number of issues with voluntary self-exclusion that we identified um, with regard to Nova Scotia casinos. So a series of recommendations that we put forward included uh, moving away from the sole option of a lifetime ban term, which obviously is part of this uh, amendment that's before the legislature, and to implement a less onerous reinstatement process, uh, both of which we believe, and based on research, which you'll hear more about, I'm sure, um, has, a, has been found to have a significant chilling effect on uptake. Uh, people get intimidated. Um, with the whole notion of lifetime, et cetera. So as a result, the numbers, the enrollment numbers are not generally as high. Uh, research has shown that most experts can, uh, favor a continuum of ban lengths. Uh, it sort of suits the unique circumstances of individuals as opposed to one, one size fits all. In Canada, across all jurisdictions other than Nova Scotia, the range is from six months to five years, and, a, and years in between, sometimes three, five, and then lifetime option. The lifetime option does exist if people want to take that. Um, research that we've conducted at the Res Responsible Gambling Council showed that um, a strategy of active reinstatement is important, um, as long as the process isn't so onerous that it might deter people from getting involved in the program in the first place. Um, different approaches can be taken depending on whether somebody has fulfilled their self-exclusion period without incident. And, and often there are breaches that can happen. And what we've found is that um, if people at the end of their term are forced to reapply for entry, uh, they can go through any number of programs such as a, a little educational, and some jurisdictions will require people to watch an educational video, go through a process and have discussions and make a determination themselves as to whether they're ready to return. Um, many people, as I said, do opt for a lifetime ban if they think that's best suited to their particular circumstances. Other people might just decide they need a six month break because their family circumstances have changed or their, their job situation has changed, whatever. So I want to make a point though that in addition to variable, variable ban lengths and active reinstatement program, there's a number of other recommendations that Responsible Gambling Council made to the uh, casino corporation. And these come under the heading of policy and practice. They're, they're not obviously legislative changes, but they're policy, um, best practices and policy. And this would include things like actively promoting the program, educating people that it exists, both within the casino environment and outside of it. Um, a, a registration process at the casino or offsite that's respectful, presented in plain language, um, includes information on help resources, um, and offers a referral to counseling, because quite often that's uh, something that people are willing to take up at that moment. Um, and frankly, you know, we believe that this is the right path, uh, that this would bring Nova Scotia in line with other provinces and, and the way they manage their voluntary self-exclusion. And uh, I think it's really important that, that these are implemented and I think it will help get you know, um, Nova Scotia to a, a first-rate exclusion program if, if they're implemented. So, thank you. Thank you very much for your comments. Uh, questions? Ms. Lonas Croft. Thank you for your presentation. Um, I'm sort of um, curious about um, voluntary exclusion. Um, you said there, you um, 
check out different examples of it. Can you give me an example of a voluntary exclusion? That you In terms of ban length? A demonstration, or? yes. Oh, oh, I see. oh yes, yeah. yes. Uh, so we, we actually, um, it's not mystery shop, because they know that we're there and we've, we've met them, but we ask their security staff, it's generally security that do the registrations, to actually take us through the process. So we always travel in team of two. We do our site visit two people. One of our staff will take notes. The other will actually sit down and go through the process. So we ask the security person to, from beginning to end, um, what they would do in order to register someone in this program. Um, and the differences in scores, interestingly, the policies, et cetera, are the same between the two casinos, but the scores were a little bit different. And in part, it's because one casino did a better job of the registration process than the other. They, they just, they took more time, they encouraged questions, they um, explained the process in plain language. So uh, we take all of those um, elements into consideration when determining. So a vol I, I just need clarification on a voluntary life exclusion, you cannot change your mind. But it's voluntary. Yes, as I understand, it is. Well, it's it's involuntarily voluntary. Okay. Or, 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 uh, or okay. reverse. A yes. play on words. Yes. <laughs> it, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much. You're Mr. Johns. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm just, if you would excuse my ignorance, I'm really not uh, familiar with uh, your group, so I just want to ask a quick question. Um, I looked at the website, and I, I see it says that it's an independent nonprofit organization. I'm curious to know how where the funding comes from for for your agency. Is it funded through the federal government? Is it a fee for service structure? Right. Yeah, sure. It's a, a blended approach. We don't receive federal funding, but we do receive probably 50% of our budget from the Provincial Ministry of Health in Ontario. Oh. So we run a number of programs in Ontario that are paid for by government. Um, we also have a research department which does internal research, just best practice research. We also do fee-for-service. So for my program, for example, uh, there is a fee for us to deliver this. It, as I said, we have we devote two staff to the process for about four months. Um, the standards that we base the program on are public domain, you know, they're on our website. And uh, so it's a bit of a blended model. Okay. All right. Thank you. Mr. Constanzo. <coughs> so a quick question. I actually know somebody who has uh, um, registered or prevented himself from mm -hmm. uh, gambling, a very responsible person, wonderful. I, I didn't understand, is it different in different provinces or different casinos that give the information differently? I, I didn't understand what, why Halifax had Right. Uh, it's just, yeah, we look at uh, the type and the scope of information that's provided at the time. Often when people are at that point and they've just <laughs> made what is a very difficult personal decision, uh, they can be upset and, a bit, you know, any number of uh, emotions going on. So what we look for are very professional um, registration process where a lot of information is handed off, uh, that the process is explained, in, again, in plain language, um, in, that is offered in different languages because of, you know, just so that people can function in their own mother tongue. Um, we look for something that's not rushed, that's private. So there's a whole series of metrics that we use uh, to measure how well um, a registration is, is being handled. And it, it does vary from province to province, yes. So my experience, he's, he's very positive about and he's, he's a, a Nova Scotians and, yeah, and is absolutely no problem with what he has experienced. Right. So I'm surprised that Halifax has a problem, that was my... Well, I think where you're seeing the low scores generally is it's, it is the ban length issue is the, is the real problem. It's not so much necessarily the, the way the registration was carried out at that moment at those two casinos, but rather that... Uh, the ban length, uh, the lifetime option was the only opportunity for people that the reinstatement required somebody going before a tribunal, which a lot of people would find, could find very difficult. Um, the numbers that are uh, people that are registered in self-exclusion are relatively low compared to other jurisdictions. So I, 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 don't, I wouldn't want to say that it's because it was mishandled at either of those casinos at that moment, but rather the other policies that are in place are, well, legislative 
issues that are in place that don't give people more flexibility. So that's that was the issue. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Chase. Mr. Burrell. Uh, thanks for this clear explanation. Oh. Uh, I, I just was wondering about the point you were making about the um, extra policy recommendations you made coming out of the accreditation about um, ease of registration and promotion of the option of self-exclusion. Right. Can you give us any sense uh, of uh, how you view compliance with those recommendations since 2016? Um, I think... Well, a lot of those issues are policy issues, mm -hmm. you know, in practice. Um, are you talking about compliance in Nova Scotia or yeah, no, in Nova yes, Scotia? No. Yeah, we found uh, very good compliance with, with the requirements that were in place. Uh, we just think that the requirements in some case, in some elements of the process should change. But for the most part, um, both casinos scored very well in all other areas. So training was very well conducted. The staff were trained across the board. Um, their corporate policies were good where they could be. It's just, of course, they're restricted in terms of things like ban uh, lengths and things that we're talking about today. Uh, but for the most part, they scored very well. What dragged them down was, in fact, the voluntary self-exclusion program. So just so the committee is aware, we're going, we're invited to come back in 2019 to do another um, audit of the program, and uh, we'll go through exactly the same process again. And, and with, if these changes are adopted and the practices are put in place to support VSE and others, then I expect their scores will go up. Thank you. Thank you very much. Without further question, yeah. appreciate your comments. Thank you. Mr. John Kelly. Welcome, Mr. Kelly. Good noon. Mr. Chair, members of the committee, I appreciate the opportunity to speak with you this afternoon um, and uh, to express my support for what you're doing. Um, I spent, until last year, 20 years as the CEO of the Responsible Gambling Council, uh, and before that, about 20 years in policy development with the Government of Ontario, not in gaming policy, but disability, children's services, those kinds of things. So I come at self-exclusion from the point of view of good public policy, but also the point of view of gaming policy, what the best thing to do to manage gambling in a way and to reduce the risk that someone will get into gambling problems. Over 20 years at the Responsible Gambling Council, we looked at gaming policy, at prevention policy. We developed many prevention programs, including the uh, accreditation program that Sue Birds just talked about. We talked with gamblers, we talked to people who have had first-hand experience of gambling problems, policymakers, gaming providers, in an attempt to come up with the best set of best practices that we could think of. And we uh, developed a set of best practices related to self-exclusion two, on two different occasions. One was a general best practice in self-exclusion, and another one related to specifics of reinstatement Self-exclusion, when it was originally created, was the, the first self-exclusion program was in Kansas in the United States. Um, it came with, uh, which I'll speak to a little bit later, the um, withholding winnings. In the United States, withholding winnings has been part of their policy since self-exclusion was introduced. One of the few areas where the United States is actually ahead of Canada in their public policy. Self-exclusion has evolved. It was originally a catch-and-release program, as some people in the gaming industry call it. That is, you're not supposed to be here, you, you agree that you will not come, and we will try to catch you. It was enforcement-oriented. Over the, over the last 20 years, it's evolved a lot to a program which is designed to help people, to support people, to give people more options, to help them manage their gambling not just 
for people who have lost control, but for people who choose to use this tool uh, for other reasons. So uh, people choose self-exclusion for a whole variety of reasons. I'll come back to that in a minute. So we, having looked at self-exclusion through all of these processes, we came to the conclusion that based on all of the evidence, the research, the testimony, the, the, the testimony of individuals, that these three provisions that you have before you, voluntary individuals setting their own band lengths, disentitlement of winnings while people are excluded, and a defined reinstatement process were useful and good changes. Individual choice in setting ban lengths has many advantages. The first advantage is you do not have to make a commitment for a lifetime. That's a hard thing to do. Some people will try out self-exclusion, will, will uh, commit to self-exclusion for six months and try it and renew their ban. There are, where you have a variety of bans, you have more flexibility and you have more responsibility for the individual themselves. You keep responsibility for the individual more. Keep them engaged in the process, in managing what they want to do. It's less intimidating. The disentitlement of winnings removes the incentive for people to gamble. If you can't win, if you say, I'm excluded from this venue or all venues, and I know that I cannot win if I go back, that takes away an incentive. Now, in the United States, this has been done, as I mentioned, for many years. In Canada, it's becoming more and more, it's, it's kind of come across the, the country, beginning in British Columbia, where it was introduced about eight years ago. So, disentitlement is another tool to support the individual and to support self-exclusion. Active reinstatement processes. In many places, when a person self-excludes, they self-exclude for a period of time, and when that time ends, their name comes off the list, they can come back. It's simple. You can walk in the door the next day. The active reinstatement process changes that. It says if you want to come back, you have to go through a process of, first of all, indicating you want to come back. You meet with somebody from a venue, some operator, or someone who is a... Uh, Perhaps the, there are people who work in the on-site responsible gambling centers in, in across the country. You meet with a person, you talk to them about your plans. In some cases, you work out a plan about how you're going to come back safely. In many cases, people are required to go through some kind of educational program before they come back. There's also usually a cooling off period. In Ontario, for example, there's a cooling off period of about a month. You say you want to come back, you meet with somebody from, the, uh, from some gaming operator, um, you have a discussion about your plans, you have an educational process, and then you have to wait another month before you come back. It's to enable the person to come back fully considering the implications of what they're doing. So what you're proposing to do in Nova Scotia with these three provisions will bolster and improve the self-exclusion program and it cannot help but make it a lot stronger and, a, and it is likely to mean that a great number of people who would not have chosen self-exclusion because of the lifetime ban will now be able to opt into it. So thank you and I'm happy to respond to your questions. Thank you, Mr. Kelly. Very informative. Questions? Ms. Zan. <clears throat> Thank you very much for the presentation. I, I just, sorry, I, I missed which group are you with or who are you representing right well, now? Or? I retired from the Responsible Gambling Council a year ago, so I'm not representing a group. I, I uh, am particularly committed to good public policy and good gaming policy, and I think these are good, so I ask to be to speak with this committee. 
Right, okay, thank you. Because it would have been nice if um, this amendment was happening in the context of an update to the responsible gaming strategy. Uh, I would have liked to see that more in, more talked about and involved. I have a question for you regarding gambling. Uh, I was told by people who are gambling uh, addiction experts that if you have a gambling addiction, it's like alcoholism or any other addiction. Even if you spend one quarter in a gambling situation, it's the same as if you spend a million dollars. The rush that they get is in the anticipation of what is going to come. It doesn't even matter whether they win or they lose. It's the, it's the adrenaline that runs through their system while they are anticipating the win. So in that sense, is there really any such thing as a responsible <laughs> gambling yeah. uh, ruse or program for someone who is an addict? You know, over the last 20 years in, in the gambling area, and before that in the drug and alcohol area, I, I, there are, you always hear this about one drink or one, uh, and I don't doubt that that's true for some people. Yeah, However, addicts. It's true for addicts. If you could allow our presenter to speak, that's uh, right. Sam, Yes, I'm just adding to what he had to say. I think that you find a range of opinion among people who are the treatment providers, like the ones you're talking about. It's quite possible for many people to say, I am doing something that's destructive and I'm going to stop. And take their responsibility in their own hands or I'm going to cut back. Like, I, I just think that the, the view that one drink or, or one kind of experience of gambling, I, that that is not a universal experience. While I acknowledge that this is an experience for some people, the person who started the Responsible Gambling Council was a compulsive gambler. I won't go into his life story, but it, there was no question about And he absolutely believed that, that he could not. But I think he would have acknowledged, Tibor Barsoni was his name, he, d he died about a year ago, uh, that many people do not have the same experience. They are not that as far down the road. And there need to be options for everybody, not just people who are at the core of an addiction. And I think that that's part of self-exclusion and all responsible gambling policies need to provide for the whole range of people. Thank you. Um as somebody who is an addict, I'm an alcoholic, have been my entire life, sober 23 years now, almost 24, I can tell you that yes, one drink is too many and 5,000 are not enough. Uh, so when somebody is an addict, it's a lot different than somebody who just does it for the fun of it and can stop. Believe me, it is very, very difficult for an addict to stop, especially on their own. So. Um, so the idea that there is this uh, responsible gaming uh, program, it's great for people who are not addicts. But I would say that for the people who are the core people who are actually spending most of the money uh, in gambling, it, it, I don't know if it really helps uh, whether it's a lifetime ban or not. Once an addict, usually you're, you're an addict. Uh, but I have to say that it concerns me greatly that the province has taken off uh, this, the ban. And uh, I think we need to look a lot more carefully at addiction and what the cause is and how, how we can, can solve and help the people with addictions to deal with their problems. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Johns. Yeah, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Mr. Kelly, I'm just curious, um, are you, do you live in Nova Scotia now? No, I live in Toronto. Okay. All right, thank you. <laughs> Ms. Martin. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I know this was talked about uh, during the during the reading of this bill in the House, and, and I don't know that a clear answer came from it, but I'm wondering about your experience in other jurisdictions about the forfeiture of the money. Mm -hmm. So if I'm a gambling addict and I spend $1,000 and I win $5,000, 
when I'm discovered, do I get my $1,000 back and then the, the somebody keeps my $4,000? Where, where does that money go? Mm -hmm. In terms of the getting the money back, most jurisdictions do not provide any of the money coming back, partly because they don't know how much there actually is. Like if somebody plays a slot machine and then plays another one and plays, they, they have great difficulty in tracking the money unless they're, they're very specific circumstances. Uh, I have heard about uh, people who got some money back when it was absolutely clear how much money they spent. Mm -hmm. In terms of the money forfeited, that in most jurisdiction goes into some form of earmarked fund which is used for prevention or treatment, some or perhaps research into problem gambling. So it's not it uh, it's not returned to general revenues because that would appear to to be a benefit to the uh, organizations providing gaming. So um, I think most jurisdictions who have this kind of forfeiture program would recommend keeping the money separate and identifiable and using it for the purposes of reducing problem gambling. Thank you and, and that would be my hope that it would be used for the you know prevention mm -hmm. and treatment of mental health and addictions yes. and or whatever else could it, if I may say it's it's also unpredictable money. Like once you introduce a forfeiture if you're successful that money should go down because people should gamble less because they're not going to win. So you could get a certain amount of money early on, but it's, it's completely unpredictable money, so to use it for any form of operating cost makes it a uh, questionable source. But clearly we should know where the money is going when and if it is forfeited, though, I guess sure. is my yeah, point. Absolutely. Thank you. Mr. McGuire. Thank you for being here today. I just had two quick questions. The previous speaker, uh, I think the point the previous speaker she was trying to make was that with a lifetime ban, uh, problem gamblers are less likely to sign up uh, yes. because they see it as that's it forever. Um, and other jurisdictions have had more success with helping uh, keep uh, problem gam gamblers out of casinos by having um, extended periods instead of a lifetime ban. Do you agree with that? Sorry, having... Having a set period instead of a lifetime ban. So five years, ten years. I do think definitely that having uh, less than a lifetime ban is a good idea. And once you do that, to engage the individual in helping in their choice, uh, is another benefit. Uh, like, a, 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 as I said, and I, as I think Sue Bird said as well, this is having to make a lifetime decision and to know that it's going to be enforced and you're going to be subject to a very complex process if you want to come back um, is a deterrent. Uh, so, Having more flexibility to make your decisions that fit your lifestyle, that fit your life. You know, I, I read just this morning, for example, about a man in Ontario who had a, a ban 20 years ago. And it was essentially then a, 20, a lifetime ban. And he gambled. Uh, he set up a ban. He, he was going through a difficult time in life. He retired and his wife died. He got into gambling heavily. He banned himself and this is 20 years on. Uh, so there's an example of a person who was going through a bad patch in life and maybe needed self-exclusion to help him get through that. He may not have needed a lifetime ban. He, he, he might have chosen something different if it, were, if it were available at the time. But it was very it was part of his life at the time, and uh, uh, better to offer that person options that keep the decision making in his hand than take it away from him. So one last question. May I ask what your experience is and your education is? Um, my experience, I, I 
worked for the last 20 years as CEO of the Responsible Gambling Council. I worked for about 20 years before that as a policy advisor, a policy director with the Government of Ontario. I have a PhD from uh, University of Edinburgh in Public Policy and Administration. Thank you. Yeah. Mr. Dontremont. Thanks. This is probably a question I probably should have asked to Ms. Burge as she was here. But how robust should a program of self-exclusion be? Um, because the question, I, I, or as I understand the program is here, at least at the casino, maybe another question for Mr. Roberts when he comes up, is, you know, you self-exclude, uh, they create a exclusion sheet for you, mm -hmm. they put it in a binder, um, the security is going to have to check that binder once in a while. So really, a person can get in and out of that casino probably a few times before he or she is noticed. So how robust should the program be in self-exclusion? Well, I guess the accreditation program expects it to be quite robust. Mm -hmm. The standards that were created for RG Check, I was involved in the original uh, design of RG Check, um, looks to quite a number of provisions. What, what do you do to find somebody? What do you do, for example, uh, how robust are your processes when you're coming in? You could have a binder. Right. You could have some form of uh, a better form of picture. You could have, um, in British Columbia, license plate recognition. That's uh, cameras that are uh, picking up license plates as they come into the parking areas. You can have facial recognition. So there are quite a number of ways that you can identify somebody and quite a number of choices in terms of what you do after that. You know, kind of do you just move them out or do you say, come and talk to me? You know, let's find out why you're here. You, we got somebody on site in most places, including uh, Nova Scotia, you can talk to. Some, the the on-site uh, responsible gambling centers, they're called different things in different mm -hmm. places. But um, all of these provisions are really, are really useful, um, but it's the combination of them that the accreditation program is looking for. And the more robust, the, the, the higher the score, as Sue Burge has said. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kelly. Appreciate your time. Thank you. Mr. Chris Roberts. Welcome, Mr. Roberts. Thank you very much. And uh, excuse the nasal voice, I'm on the, uh, the tail end of a cold. <laughs> Uh, so I'm uh, just circulating uh, a few comments we have. I thought it might be uh, helpful to have somebody from the casino uh, that deals with with uh, with our guests and with these programs on an everyday basis, available to answer questions. So I'll speak for a very short period and then uh, you know be available for any questions you may have. Uh, again, I'm on the front line, uh, you know, dealing with with our guests and of course with our staff uh, all the time. So. Uh, my name is Chris Roberts. I'm the general manager of uh, Casino Nova Scotia, the operations in both Halifax and Sydney. I've worked in the gaming industry uh, for the better part of 20 years, starting in horse racing, uh, into slot operations, and then uh, into, uh, into casinos. I've been at Casino Nova Scotia now for just more than three years. Uh, I have experience in, uh, in jurisdictions across the country, uh, Alberta, Ontario, British Columbia, and, uh, and now into Nova Scotia. Uh, so I certainly, on behalf of uh, Great Canadian Gaming, our parent company, the operator of the casinos uh, in Nova Scotia, very supportive of the changes that are being recommended. This is part of a, uh, a robust and collaborative process uh, that's involved the casino, that's involved our crown partner and our crown regulator, and of course, um, uh, you know, many, many seasoned experts, experts that know a lot more about responsible gambling than I do. Uh, I'm certainly happy to answer any questions about the operation, but uh, unlike the last speaker, I do not have a PhD in public policy or uh, extensive uh, uh, professional responsible gambling training. So responsible gambling at Casino Nova Scotia is very much part of our culture. So for all 500 plus team members at both sites, uh, there's a fairly robust training program. 
uh, in place. Uh, there are refreshers uh, every year uh, for each of our staff as well. So uh, we have a number of, uh, you know, we're very, very blessed to have a number of 20 plus year employees. It doesn't mean it's a one and done. You don't come in and do a responsible gambling training and then never hear of the subject again. It's something that, that uh, uh, we deal with on a regular basis, retraining. Uh, and it, it's, it's part of our culture, as I said, when we do town hall meetings, uh, when we meet as, a, as a departments, uh, there's regularly responsible gambling uh, checkpoints uh, as part of the business. So we have active committees at both of our sites that deal with responsible gambling. Just to give you a little background, VSE is part of that, but VSE is just one tool in a robust responsible gambling uh, toolkit that involves our on-site responsible gambling resource centers, uh, training, conversations, uh, and then of course counseling and other tools that are available uh, for staff or for guests uh, that have questions or, uh, or need more information. So I really wanted to speak in, in support of the programs, but as I said, uh, really more just to give you an opportunity to ask questions uh, of me since I'm the one that's on the ground um, dealing with this uh, in Nova Scotia all the time. So I'll, uh, I'll turn things back over to you, Mr. Chair. Ms. Sand. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you for coming here today and uh, doing your presentation. I have a couple of questions. Um, do you anything? Do you know anything about the the My Play program? The fact that um, there was a decision to eliminate it, with no alternative plan really established, uh, and following the elimination of My Play, VLT revenues in Nova Scotia rose by eight. Eight million. Uh, do you have any uh, anything to say about the my play, and whether it should be uh, have something else put in its place? So uh, my my knowledge of, of my play is is sort of tangential. I, I I wasn't involved in the my play program. It predated my time being in Nova Scotia. Mm -hmm. I'm certainly familiar uh, with uh, with what my play is and how it was rolled out and how it was used. Uh, my play was not in uh, use at the casino properties. Uh, it was a VLT program mm -hmm. uh, used uh, throughout the province. Uh, I am certainly not an expert on my play. Okay. I think you'd be uh, better served with the uh, NSGC. Uh, okay. To provide thank you. I wasn't sure if they had it in at the casino or not, but um, can you tell me, have there ever been any suicides at our casino here in Halifax or any attempted suicides? There are none, none that I know of. Um, again, I've only been here three years, uh, but there are none, none, none that I know of at the casinos at either Halifax or Sydney. And do you know what the ratio or, or would be for casinos across Canada if there have been very many suicides? I know that in other jurisdictions in America and Australia, other countries, there, there are suicides almost every year uh, from gamblers who are addic addicts throwing themselves out windows and things like that. Um, in my own family, my, my cousin's husband actually committed suicide from gambling, uh, as well from his gambling addiction, which nobody was aware of until he suicided, he chose suicide. So just curious if you know anything about the rate in, in Canada. I don't personally uh, know what the rate is. Problem gambling is uh, you know, it's a serious matter. It affects a lot. It affects people. It affects a lot of people. I have people in my family uh, who it's affected as well. Uh, but as far as ratios or statistics or numbers per casino, I, I don't have any access to those numbers. Okay. And do you think that this? Ms. Zan, if I may, we have other presenters. We can come back to you. Okay. Mr. Dontremont. I'm just wondering, since I did ask the question of the previous uh, the previous speaker, just how does the exclusion program work today in the casino, and and how do you envision it to work? after the, these changes go in place? Yeah, so uh, um, uh, two speakers ago, the, uh, uh, um, the, uh, the lady from the Responsible Gambling Bridge, Council yeah. walked through the, uh, uh, the process. So in, our, in our, either of our sites, what will happen is uh, there will either be a behavior that's noticed, and that's really what it's about. It's, it, you know, for our staff, they're trained to notice behaviors, to notice key messages. Uh, it's not a matter, it's very, very rare that someone walks in and presents themselves to a, uh, an employee and says, I have a gambling problem, um, you know, please help me, or, or what services do you have? It's much, um, uh, it's much uh, more overt than that. Uh, you know, it will usually be um, things that are noticed, uh, key words that are mentioned, and typically what a staff member will do is in a, in a very non-intrusive way, 
uh, because the, the, the first thing you learn in responsible gambling training is you don't walk up to someone and say, hey, it seems like you may have a gambling problem. It's, 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 a, it's a, a much uh, softer presentation and giving people the ability to ask for that help. Once voluntary self-exclusion uh, becomes an option or becomes something folks are talking about, it's then elevated. This is not the kind of thing that people are not comfortable talking about this in, in a public space. Um, you know, this is, for some people, this is, this is a very sensitive uh, matter. So what we'll do is it will be elevated typically to a senior uh, security officer or security supervisor who will remove uh, the guest from the floor uh, they'll go to a private place that's operated just off the casino floor in both properties in Halifax and Sydney, where they can have a quiet conversation, uh, talk about uh, what options are available, uh, you know, vis-a-vis -vis the, via the voluntary self-exclusion program. Uh, and at that time, a, a player can either take information, can ask questions, or can activate the program. If, in fact, they activate or opt into the program, um, there are there's some paperwork to fill out. Once that's all said and done, of course, there's, there are photos uh, and, and there are databases where this information is entered into. And one of the benefits of, of being in small communities like Halifax and Sydney is that most of our staff or players that are voluntarily self-excluding, we have a relationship you know, with these folks. We know who they are. Uh, whether it's gaming staff directly on the floor, more likely security staff on site, or the unknown, or the, pardon me, the unseen entity of surveillance who have access to these databases, these photos. Um, and uh, it, it's not an uncommon occurrence for a, an excluded player to be noted on site. It's not an uncommon occurrence for them to be intercepted before they even make it to a table game. Uh, using you know these these uh, you know the, the staff's familiarity with these folks and the databases that are available. So, um, as as the previous speaker said, we do not use uh, a facial recognition software in Nova Scotia at the present time. It's certainly something that could be looked at in the future. Um, it is a it is a more manual process, uh, but uh, we have very few um, voluntarily self excluded players that would not be known to uh, to casino staff. Okay, thank you. Mr. Johns. Yeah, thank you very much. So currently we're at, uh, where it's kind of only one level of exclusion with the amendments to build this in front of us uh, with uh, staggered levels. Is that going to be harder to uh, enforce, more confusing, or how do you feel that that's going to work in regards to enforcement? So I, th I, you know, my personal opinion would be, and of course, you know, we don't have, um, you know, we don't have any track under us on this one. We haven't, uh, we haven't had a staggered program in the past. Uh, with more people in the database, there will obviously be more information uh, to keep track of. Uh, my expectation would be that with varying lengths, you will have more people taking advantage, uh, or I shouldn't, that, that's the wrong terminology, opting into. Uh, into the program, um, but uh, I, I don't anticipate it would be any significantly more challenging than it is now. It really is a matter of recall, uh, and again, security staff aren't walking around with binders, but our surveillance staff are certainly keeping track, particularly of people that have more recently self-excluded. So I, I will you know, fully admit, had somebody self-excluded 15 years ago, it is less likely that we would identify them immediately. Had somebody excluded two months ago, it's very unlikely that they would end up on property without being noticed. Thank you. Ms. Sand. Thank you. Uh, so my, my next question was, um, how many people do exclude at this point in time? Do you have a figure for that? Yeah, the last time I, I saw the, uh, the update, it was just over 2,000 people since the introduction of the program in Nova Scotia, which, which would have happened, I believe, at the time that the casinos were first brought in. So I believe it was just over 2,025. It's, it's, in, it's you know, plus or minus 10 in that, uh, into that number. And so what makes you think that this new change will make things better? Well, I think, I, I think it will make things uh, better in that there will be fewer impediments to people actively entering the program. So again, I'm, I'm not the one on the front line, um, you know, discussing VSE with, with guests that may want to information about it, but I have secondhand through security staff heard several times that when guests learn that it is a lifetime ban, 
that it's something they want to back away from, that it's, it's just a little bit too much meat, uh, you know, on, on, the, on that bone. And I think with, I think it's only logical to think that if people had options that were, you know, smaller than a lifetime ban, that you'd have more folks, perhaps on the bubble on the decision, actively taking advantage of, of, of the program. Again, that's just my, that's just my logic. That would be my truth. Um, I certainly can't see it being uh, any less likely uh, for guests to take, take advantage of it. I think one thing I just like to make a point of is that when somebody is an addict, um, the point is you're usually an addict for life. It doesn't go away. Oftentimes you will switch addictions between different types of uh, substances or activities, but I, I really have doubts as to whether this will help somebody who is a true addict. Uh, it's hard to imagine that they're going to just admit right there on the spot, yes, I'm an addict and I need help and I'm going to just, I need to do this for life. That takes mental health uh, help and addiction services. So um, I, I'm not quite sure if I believe that this is going to help in any way, but I believe that it's important that we start to think in terms of the people who are addicts and what we can do to help them. So uh, in that sense, it's a step forward, but I don't know if it's really going to help in the long run. Thank you. Well, as, 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 if I could just mm -hmm. respond to that, because. I hear everything you're saying, and, mm -hmm. and um, I think those are very logical positions to take. You know, I think when it comes to problem gambling, it's really a matter of ed the more education and the more tools that are available, either on site or off site, or through third party call in centers or counseling, or just having you know staff on site that are, are available and willing to talk about it. VSE is just one tool. You know, it's not the only tool. I would not personally say it's even the most effective tool, mm -hmm. uh, but it is one tool that's in the responsible gambling kit. I would also argue strongly that it's not just addicts that take advantage of the VSE program. It can be for people that, you know, the circumstances in their lives may change. They may uh, be participating more than their family is comfortable with or that their resources at the time will allow. So, um, you know, some people can enter a program like this of varying lengths and six months later very much be in, a, be in a position to want to return and have the means and have the control to return. So it's, it's not just a program for addicts, although I'm sure that a good portion of the folks that, that exercise the VSE are, are you know, it's do have problems. It's pretty extreme, so yeah, I would think. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Roberts. Thank you. Mr. Jamie Weeb. Oh, I'm sorry. My apologies. <laughs> A lot. <laughs> My apologies. That's the floor okay. is yours. That's okay. So thank you for the opportunity to come here to, today to talk about your um, the VSC amendments. Uh, just uh, I'll just talk about my background since that has come up in a few of the questions. I have a master's in psychology and a PhD in epidemiology community health from the Department of Medicine at University of Manitoba. I am currently the director of player health at British Columbia Lottery and Gaming, which is uh, the gaming operator for the province of BC. And in that role, I will have the responsibility for programs and initiatives to, um, designed to increase safer play and reduce harms. And I oversee the, um, they're called Game Sense, but the um, responsible gambling centers in the various casinos. Prior to that, um, you've heard from two of my colleagues. I was the director of research and development at the Responsible Gambling Council. And before that, I've held positions, research positions. Uh, actually, I'm in, living in my sixth province now um, at the Alberta Alcohol and Drug Abuse Commission, the Addictions Foundation of Manitoba, and the Con Canadian Centre on Substance Abuse. So I'm here today not representing anyone uh, other than myself and kind of my background in research. Um, in this area. I have been involved in research for 20 years, for the past 20 years. Um, I've done numerous prevalence studies. My focus has been on trying to understand the prevalence and scope and nature of problem gambling in Canada and, um, and better ways of preventing harms and uh, increase uh, healthier play. <clears throat> 
In uh, making my comments today, I'm specifically drawing upon research that I have either directed or have been heavily involved with, and this includes um, evaluations and reviews of self-exclusion programs around the world, longitudinal research with people with gambling problems, uh, numerous focus groups with people in treatment with gambling problems, the development of best practices and standards for VS uh, voluntary self-exclusion, as well as the development of best practices for a reinstatement program. First, I would like to make a general comment about vo voluntary self-exclusion programs overall. I think it's important to recognize that it is one tool. It is not a panacea for problems. It is a tool to assist and provide support. How, that being said, <clears throat> of the research that has been conducted, systematic reviews um, have shown VSE to be an effective tool to help support players to gain control over their gambling. Um, I, I currently work for BCLC, as I mentioned. Um, I'm relatively new there, but they are, um, we are embarking on our third major study of self-exclusion evaluation. Uh, commissioned, um, we've engaged the University of Fraser Valley, and I can tell you that results from the previous study show that the program is deemed to be achieving its general purpose in that it, it is enrolling those with more serious gambling problems. It's having an immediate effect on decreasing um, problem gambling severity index scores, and that's how we measure uh, level of problem gambling. That's what the prevalent studies in the country use. And over time, the program reduces participants' level of depression, stress, and anxiety. Um, <clears throat> Two minutes remaining. Oh my gosh, really? Uh, wow. Uh, okay. Um, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Ten for presentations, five for questions. I'm sorry. Oh, <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> it's like, are you, is, how is that possible? I spent ten minutes introducing myself. How narcissistic of me. My apologies, Miss Wee. <laughs> okay. I'm, um, I, I just want to point out one of the recommendations from the last research and re research study, and it's, it's applicable to what we're talking about today, I feel, is was for more advertising of the program to attract players who are starting to progress towards a problem earlier in that progression. And, and the point of that is, and what I have found in my research, I have spent a lot of time uh, trying to develop measures um, and understanding the prevalence and nature of problem gambling among uh, the adult population, but also among youth. And that gambling risks fall on a continu continuum with the most severe here, but there is a continuum to getting there. And we, we are so, we often forget about prevention because prevention is one of the hardest things to do. Um, but I think um, it, it speaks to the, it, it, it speaks to what I'm going to talk about next, and that is um, the conversation around having ban options and, and, and providing more alternatives um, in addition to, a, or rather than, sorry, the current lifetime ban. Research um, that has involved people in treatment with ga um, for a gambling problem, uh, with treatment counselors, with researchers and other experts for the most part has found that lifetime bans are thought to be ineffective because they could deter people from registering. Shorter bans are less intimidating, especially for those people who are maybe not at the most severe end, but are starting to have concerns with the way, with their relationship with gambling. They're gambling more than intended. Maybe they're starting to chase losses. That is a perfect time to say, well, we have to get better at this, by the way. I think there's a long way to go. Um, but um, the fear is, if that, if, if the life ban, if it's lifetime ban or nothing, it might exclude people where this could be a prevention mechanism as well. And I just wanted to throw out some data, um, just from the recent study that was conducted in BC. BC has four ban options: six months, one year, two years, and three years. Um, just a simple question was, um, how satisfied are you with your? With, with your ban option decision. I can say that 60% of the sample um, chose between six months and one year. Um, of those, 90% were, were satisfied with that. Uh, two years, 7% um, chose that, 100% were satisfied with that ban option, and finally three years, um, 33, about a third percent of the sample chose that option, 84% were satisfied with that ban length. 
I'm going to talk a little bit about ineligible jackpots um, because this to, to um, this is a component and an, an additional support to a VSC program. And in recent years, many jurisdictions have, have introduced this practice. BCLC was actually the first jurisdiction to introduce ineligible jackpots in 2009. The practice is simply intended as a way to remove one incentive, not the only incentive, to breach a voluntary self-exclusion agreement. It just makes gambling to make money as is a risk, is a risk factor and, and is a common motivation behind breaching. And I just want to also mention that in research that I brought up around, that was conducted in BC, um, the researchers identified ineligible jackpots as a potential contributing factor in the reduction of breaches. So from one study to the next, they saw fewer people breaching. It's very hard to establish cause, as you probably know, but they do um, offer that as a possible reason for a reduction. I'm now going to just move on to reinstatement and I think it's important to realize that as long as a pers person who is on voluntary self-exclusion has not actually reinstated, they are always on voluntary self-exclusion. So you cannot get off your voluntary self-exclusion until you actively reinstate. Um, it is, and, and the thing with reinstatement too is that in some places your self-exclusion is up, you simply return to gambling. With an active reinstatement program, it's an opportunity to have a conversation, to have a time of, of self-awareness and reflection um, for, for reasons such as, uh, you know, there's a reason that you wanted to exclude a year ago, three years ago, six months ago. Are those reasons not now, do they no longer exist? What is your plan? Is this the best thing? There can be a cooling off period. Um, so it can be also another way of reintroducing sort of supports and resources to the individual that is thinking about coming back from an exclusion. Best practices recommend a different process depending on red flag behaviors, which would include things such as breaches while the person was on their VSC. So in summary, I would like to say that VSC, from the research, has been found to be an important tool for those experiencing problems with their gambling. Offering options of band length is important to increase its use and attractiveness to people who are experiencing concerns related to their gambling. Ineligible winnings removes one of the incentives to return to gambling while on VSC, and finally, with a reinstatement prog program, an individual continues to be on VSC un until they make an active decision to return. It's an opportunity to provide support and information to help the individual make an informed decision about whether or not they actually do want to return uh, to gambling. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Weep, and uh, you did very well on the time. You didn't need a chair to interfere. Ms. Zahn. Thank you very much, and sorry for all the scraping sounds outside. It's rather annoying, but um, just a quest couple of questions. Um, I've heard it said that the worst thing that can ever happen to a gambling addict is winning the very first time, that first win, and that like heroin or any other substance, they keep chasing that feeling, they keep chasing the feeling of, of that first win, um, and that they can just never get enough. So in the context of, of real addicts who do tend to put most of the money into the machines and who do tend to spend the most on, on gambling when you look at a, uh, like a, the, the data, how would you say that this actually helps them? Okay, I'm, I'm, uh, let me go back. To, okay, so you talked about a, an early big win. An early big win is a risk factor. It is not, like, there's been research done on people with gambling problems, and there's different pathways of getting there. There is some comorbidity issues that separate one population from other populations. Mm -hmm. There's some life experience, ex circumstances, loneliness, various other things. There is the, the, the big win, there's, there's uh, parents growing up in this environment. Mm -hmm. um, there's, so going just back to the um, early big win, mm -hmm. um, I would say, um, I think there's real opportunity when people do have an early big win that we could be do, doing more around education and highlighting this as a potential risk factor and a heads up because it's like chasing losses. Mm -hmm. I think it is one of, it is a brilliant message. It's like don't drink and drive. It is a simple message. Long ago did we 
stop. I, I've done a lot of alcohol research. Long ago did we stop trying to, we weren't that effective in, in, in uh, identifying or, or, or knowing exactly what to do in a public health sort of way for people who were having issues with, with, with alcohol. We st instead turned to a harm reduction approach. If, you, if you're gonna drink, don't drive. Gambling doesn't work that way. If you're gonna gamble, don't lose money. Like, there's not the same translation, but we can find indicators of increased risk, like, like the chasing losses, like the early big win. It's a perfect opportunity to have a great conversation about this mm -hmm. is important for you to realize at this time that this could be a, a risk factor later on. So I think there's so much more that we could be doing um, with those, those risk factors because because generally, um, a gambling problem just doesn't occur. Mm -hmm. So Ms. how does this help, this, this program that, that you're advocating? A voluntary self-exclusion program? It is yeah. a tool to help people stay away from gambling, but it has to be part of a larger program. It has to be linked, like the most effective, is then linked with other resources outside, because it's not just, dealing with the gambling problem isn't just about staying away from gambling. Mm -hmm. It's about connecting and getting that support outside um, as well. Like, it's, uh, it's bigger than that. Mm -hmm. I'm going to move to Ms. DiCasanzo, please. Thank you again for your presentation. And uh, I, I truly agree with you that this is not really, it's wonderful for people who are starting. The example that I know, uh, the person I know, he's definitely not um, an addict by any means. He just felt that he maybe has that something and he felt that the ban has really helped and it's a very positive thing. It's not something that is negative, but he also has, uh, um, what he, I found interesting is he travels sometimes and he's banned in Halifax, but not somewhere else. So, uh, you know, he may play for $50, $60 or $100 maximum, and he's not a total addict, but he gets it by going somewhere else once in a while. So maybe this ban is just, it's more of a temporary thing. He didn't need to go lifetime for him. So that option will be for him. And I believe in that case, it's, it's a positive. So, but it, there is also the disconnect between one uh, casino here, but if you go somewhere else, you're not identified. Absolutely. That's another it, You mean yes. different provinces? Oh, different provinces, different casinos, yeah. right? Um, there, there is work being done um, in the UK. Um, there has been for a while in terms of online gambling, uh, which is much easier. Sorry, did, sorry. did you want to? Sorry. Oh. Okay, I'm, I'm going to go to Ms. Mr. Johns. Just a reminder, folks, uh, to work through the chair so that Hansard picks up the voices uh, properly. Mr. Johns. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'm sorry, I had stepped out to Mother Nature was calling for a second when you first sat down, so I just wanted to confirm. Did you say you currently work with uh, BC Liquor Commission? A uh, lottery. Lottery Commission. Okay, so you live in British Columbia now? Okay. And, uh, and that you used to be... Uh, you used to be on the board for the uh, RC, RGC? No, I was the director of um, research, and, um, research and development. Oh, okay. Great, thank um, you, Ms. Weep. Thank you for your presentation and answering questions from the committee. Thank you. Uh, we'll now move on to uh, hear from Anna Allen with respect to Bill 55. Uh, I'm sorry, I've got a request for a short uh, washroom break. Uh, we'll take a recess for five minutes.
Yeah, so We'd like to come to order, so may members please take their seats. Paige, Paige, could you remind, excuse me, Paige, the Paige, can you remind the members to come back into the room, please? Daisy. Pardon? I think her name was Daisy. Uh, Ms. Martin, do you have another member coming? Oh. May we proceed? You feel? Yes. Yes. Bill number 55. Yeah. Okay. Okay. We will co come to order. Oh, there she is. Yes. <laughs> yes. Um, we will come to order and I call bill number 55, the region of Windsor and West Hands Municipalities Act. Um, we have two witnesses. I will call on Anna Allen. You may, Louis oh, and Louis Catino. Thank you, not Thank a you. comical act, but Sorry. he's part of the act. <laughs> All right. Um, Thank you. Members of the law amendments committee, uh, I am Mayor Anna Allen from uh, proudly Mayor of, of Windsor, birthplace of hockey, as I know you all know. So it's my pleasure to uh, present this to you today. 52 years ago, if a different decision had been made, I would not be here with you today. Our forefathers recognized that a change was needed and they considered amalgamation. The communities were obviously not ready for drama dramatic move at that time. Hindsight, eh? In my 20 years of municipal experience, I have witnessed various attempts at some form of amalgamation or regionalization. Again, it wasn't the right time. In recent history, it took a citizen group to bring it to a much broader audience, bringing awareness that changes needed to happen. Some politicians listened, others choose not to listen. There was a clear indication that many citizens wanted change. The election in 2016 proved that this was true with a significant council turnover after the election results. Expectations were high from many citizens that these new councils would work together making the right decisions for our communities. Now more than ever, there is evidence across our province that changes need to happen for our sustainability. The Now or Never report clearly indicated that each level of government is responsible to make these necessary changes for the betterment and sustainability of our province now and into the future. My town council believes the consolidation of our two municipalities is the best method of positively moving forward. We have, to, we have together tried various methods to accomplish a better way to serve our residents, but quite frankly have failed. This is the closest we will get to realizing a better way to develop the best governance structure for our residents. This is an opportunity for the Law, Law Amendments Committee in helping us and perhaps others in Nova Scotia to move forward, making this goal a reality. Our municipal communities are entitled to good governance with one that delivers streamlined services and less hindrance caused by boundaries and other common issues. We are blazing a trail in the province. I have had many inquiries on this issue from my peers in Nova Scotia and actually other provinces as well. A great deal of interest exists in the model we are attempting to build in the hopes that they too may be able to use this model for their communities. We cannot fail at this attempt. We need to do it right and engage our citizens in such a way that they know they have helped shape our future. This is a learning curve for the elected and the public. This is a journey we need to lead and take together with our citizens. We are designing and building the best governance structure possible, meeting the needs of all our residents. We are doing this for now and for future generations. 
Our community is attracting new people who are bringing new ideas and business opportunities of all kinds of recreation ideas, etc. These are the people who will run for council, bring in their insights and visions. They want change, and better yet, to be a part of the community in which they have chosen to live and work. They will grow our economy, which is greatly needed in rural Nova Scotia particularly. No matter what events brought us here today, good or not so good, it's time. Time to allow municipalities to make the needed changes, moving our communities into the future. This piece of legislation before you today will put Windsor and West Hants in the right place. The status quo is no longer an option. Help us do the right thing for our residents. Thank you. Thank you. And Ms. So, uh, if you don't mind, uh, the two of us are doing a tag, uh, tag here, and I'll just follow through. Both of our submissions are, uh, are with you. So, my name is Louis Coutinho, members of the Legislative Council, and uh, a law, sorry, Law Amendments Council. And I'm the CEO of the Town of Windsor. I've been uh, the CEO for the last 12 years. I speak in support of Bill 55, of course. So the Graham, the Graham Commission Report of 1974, the Task Force on Local Government Report of 1992, the Towns Task Force Report of 2012, the Provincial Municipal Fiscal Review of 2013, and the One Nova Scotia Report of 2014 all have one thing in common. It's a plea that the status quo cannot prevail. The councils of, councils of Windsor and West Hans have made a decision to seek special legislation to form a regional government. This is a bold initiative, and as the CEO of the Town of Windsor since 2006, I have witnessed how a region's growth has been impeded by neighborly disputes, and development in the, in the area handed over common sense solutions being obstructed by political differences. Ironically, the administrative staff on both sides have usually been aligned in our thinking. I will not go through the details in my submission on the recommendations from the Graham Commission report or the task force reports. Uh, I've uh, made notations of the recommendations, brief notations of the recommendations out of each one of those reports. What I do want to speak on is the trustee role of our councils. Members of the law amendments, uh, the role of councils is to make decisions on behalf of their constituents. Indeed, all elected officials at every level of government, whether it's federal, provincial, or municipal, make decisions based on information that they can research, read, and validate. This is their role as a trustee. While it would be advantageous to distribute such volumes of information to all of our citizens, it is impractical to do so. Democracy is being served when elected officials act as trustees in serving their constituencies. Contrary to what some may argue, uh, we have had uh, a lot of people arguing to have a plebiscite. The role of council is more than a delegate uh, simply conveying a message. Uh, they have to act, they have a role to act in the public interest. The majority of councillors have exercised that trustee role by the resolutions passed by both councils, and it is an important consideration. Both councils have also committed to ensuring we will engage the public in a continuous and responsive way to inform decision-making towards the regional government. Uh, and both councils have taken the time to, uh, to articulate amongst themselves that two things are important, communication and public engagement. With the passing of Bill 55, our first priority will be to communicate broadly on how a region will benefit from this unison and the leadership shown by both levels of government, provincial and municipal, in creating a regional government that will make the Windsor West Hans region a more vibrant and harmonious community. Thank you for hearing me, and uh, we will thank take you. questions. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Johns. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mayor Allen. And uh, Louis, it's a pleasure to see you again. And uh, I had, a, when this came up for first reading, I had a lot of questions. And now that I see you here, uh, I feel much more comfortable with any of the concerns I've had. It, uh, that I raised uh, during first reading. I do want to ask a couple things, though. Um, I do, I do think that uh, this is very forward-thinking of uh, the councils here, and and I do commend them for that. I recognize how hard it is to make that decision 
and, and let go being part of uh, HRM when we had Bedford to the county and stuff. I'm curious to know, I believe the province is committing $500,000 towards this process. Is, is that enough? Do you, do you feel that's, a, that's enough to do this? That is to take us to the end of March. So there's discussion to be had after that. Um, I think we're quite comfortable as councillors and, and as staff. I'm sure that we can address to that as well. Okay. And the only, the only other question I had was I recognize that there was a, uh, there's currently an application before the UARB, which I think was going to be heard this, this month. Why not go and wait for that process? Why, why have you come to the province and uh, kind of shelve that process? I'm curious on that. Good question. Um, some time ago, um, before my council, present day council, was approached by the citizens group had taken, who had taken out an application for amalgamation with the URB. And that, quite frankly, is the only process we have at our disposal at this time, other than dissolution. So they wanted to uh, know if the town of Windsor of the day, the council would uh, join them, and they did, the, t the council did. When the new council was elected in 2016, we didn't do anything to change that, because we supported that. Um, most of us ran on a campaign and most of the people of that about amalgamation so we knew what our citizens wanted and was requesting so we did support their application and became a joint owner of that application. The municipality of West Hans made it very clear they did not like the URB process and did not want to take control out of their destiny. Um, our council didn't disagree but we were looking for another option because we didn't know what we could do as well. So through great discussion and um, through time, um, we decided to work with the DMA and um, that led us to this. The town of Windsor um, is in the process of withdrawing their application from the URB because uh, West Hans said yes to this process, the process we are here right now about. The application uh, was suspended uh, until we had sort of, Windsor was comfortable that there was true effort in moving forward in, in combining our two municipal units together. And uh, once we were comfortable with that, with this process, we, we withdrew it. The uh, application suspension is until October 31st, and as of yet, the citizens haven't withdrawn it. They too are waiting to hear about this. And once they are comfortable that we are actually doing something, moving together in the way we should be, they feel um, they would likely withdraw their application as well. Okay. All right, thank you very much. Ms. Martin. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you for your presentation. Um, just a, a couple of comments, maybe a question. I would think that this is a process that has to go through um, having community involvement and um, constituent engagement, um, consultation. Um, and I believe, Mayor Allen, you were, when asked by All Nova Scotia, you were asked about a plebiscite, and, and you said that a plebiscite would likely block a consultation. So if that's the case, but, but you also said that community support could be built through a transition process. So if, if they would likely block a plebiscite, that, that leads me to believe that there hasn't been engaging and thoughtful um, interaction and involvement of the constituents. Um, I'm, I'm not sure about those words you, you were quoting. However, it has been the position of the town of Windsor that through example, for example, in the Picto, New Glasgow area, when it was uh, identified right up front in their attempt to amalgamate that there would be a vote at the end of it all, it was lost. And the DMA has, from experience, learned that wasn't the right process. Not because you're, you're setting yourself up to lose, but there's other tools to use in amalgamation or consolidation, whatever you want to call it. Our discussions with the municipality West Hands has been that the top two priorities we picked was a, a, a facilitator to take us through this, and the other one equally as important was communications with our residents. We feel the best tools for us to use is communication pieces on a regular basis involve communities um, as, as often as we can, and we think through education, um, that is the best tool for us to use, not necessarily a plebiscite. Um, that's the process we had agreed to use, and that's the one we're moving forward with once this legislation, if an end, it is approved. Okay, if, um, if I could. Please. Mr. If, if I could follow up on, on that, 
uh, uh, for, on behalf of the mayor. Hence the reason I spoke of council's role, trustee role in, in decisions such as these. There's voluminous information and numerous studies done on, on the benefits of amalgamation and, and what have you. Uh, as the mayor indicated in her presentation, it was first suggested by the West Hans Council 52 years ago that we have a form of regional government. And here we are, we're talking regional government. Those, are the, those were their words. Uh, when we say trustee role, council has all of the, the benefit of all of this information. It's, it's you know, they're, they're, it's, and, uh, members of law amendments, you, you know what I'm talking about. You, you get a, a whole stash of information and you make decisions based on, on the information you have in front of you. The councils were elected to make decisions on behalf of their constituencies. Would we like to have everybody have all of that information? Absolutely. Is it practical? No, it isn't. Um, and so the stage that we're at now is engaging uh, public so that they understand the process, they understand w why it is the councils have gone the route they have, and then the, both councils are determined to have a role for the community. As an example, uh, uh, one of the first uh, uh, things out of the uh, act is that the new council has to name itself. That could be a citizen, the citizens could participate in what they want to call the new municipality. Is it going to be called the West Hans Regional Municipality, the Windsor Regional Municipality, or the Avon Regional Municipality, or, or something different? But these are the kinds of things, you know, they need to know how they're going to be engaged, they need to understand the process, and there'll be certain aspects that we want to get in, you know, have them have input into, uh, into the process. Uh, those we will work with DMA on how uh, we can engage the public uh, better than, we, than we've, we've done in the past. But I hope that uh, gives uh, Mr. you... Order. Um, Mr. Donchamon has a question. We're almost out of time for questions, so... Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, in the, fir the first part of my question, and I, and I know the answer a little bit here, but I'm, I'm surprised there's no West Hants counselor or warden here. Um, I know they have a meeting today, but I'm also seeing they're probably not unanimous in their decision to go through this process. How, how, how is the group going to manage that? Because it worries me that they're not all on, completely on board here. If I might. So. Thank you. Um, their council is meeting tonight to discuss this again, uh, you, you, uh, to realize that the, their, most of their council is made of new citizen members, councillors who have never been in any position such as this before. So they're looking uh, properly at everything that they can. The warden is preparing for that meeting tonight. They have confidence, as does the CAO, that the support will be there. We, we have had facilitated sessions. We have um, got some objectives uh, declared and so on like that, So and, and our main goals and so on. So we are working towards that and have been for a couple of months now. So it's not a surprise. It's just like it's it, they're working through it. So we do have confidence that they will. Okay, and just, just so the, for the record shows, there's two letters here, one from Tanya Leopold. Um, I think she's a councillor from district, doesn't say which district, but a councillor from the district, West Hance. Um, she is against it by the look of it. And so is uh, Rupert Janek, he's councillor district one. So there are two there. So they've got a bit of a hill yes. to climb yes. there. So, okay, thank you. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. I call um, Mayor Jeff Cantwell. Everybody got their... <laughs> <laughs> I had it expressed in for you there, Chris. Madam Chair, members of law amendments, um, I've already introduced myself before, so I won't... I'll cut to the, uh, to the text of the letter you have before you. Um, one current municipal structure and geographical, uh, our, sorry, our current municipal structure and geographical boundaries were established over a century ago. How we live and work today was never even imagined back then. Yet our structure and the environment in which municipalities operate has not changed with our progress. We are set up to compete with each other. We need new tools 
and new approaches if we are to help our communities be sustainable and viable. We need to ensure our communities are resilient and vibrant. We need to be better able to respond to the needs and desires of our citizens. And we need to be able to adapt to new technology and new expectations. We need to become more efficient and more effective. Recognizing communities of interest and willingness to work together requires an environment that encourages innovative ways of working together. The town's task force in 2011 made a number of recommendations aimed at encouraging greater collaboration and cooperation amongst municipalities. We are a small province and there are many linkages between our communities. We cannot afford to continually duplicate services. We need to help each other and by doing so our province will be more successful. We need more flexibility in how municipalities can do this. The current Municipal Government Act is not flexible enough. The circumstances communities find themselves in varies across the province and there needs to be new tools available to them to improve their communities and the everyday lives of their citizens. Windsor and West Hans have come together and agreed on an approach that meets their needs. This bill will serve them well. The Nova Scotia Federation of Municipalities would like to add our voice in support of Windsor and West Hans and congratulates them on their courage and their innovation. Municipalities will learn from their experience as they move towards a new regional government. And not in the text of the letter, but uh, I'm only hopeful that uh, Wolfville and Kings County and our counterparts down in the county of Kings will uh, find themselves before you here uh, just after these guys go ahead. Thank you. Oh, um, Mr. Irving. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and I didn't get an opportunity to uh, congratulate Mayor Allen and, and Warden Zeban uh, on their leadership on this uh, on this issue. Um, and uh, Mayor Cantwell, uh, this is the position of the Federation. Is that reflective in a, a board meeting and a resolution by the board to speak uh, on behalf of uh, the Federation in your support? and? Uh, my understanding is we've used a process like this, using legislation to create uh, the regional uh, municipality of Queens and CBRM. This is sort of following along the work that was done there. Um, and I guess my supplementary question, uh, I think you've kind of answered, are you aware of other municipalities uh, in terms of watching this and, and interested uh, other Nova Scotian municipalities that are, are you know, following this and are, are, are uh, uh, considering, you know, what's going on here. Uh, thank you, Mr. Irving. Yes, um, well, to the point about it being a board resolution, um, it was the board, the board wanted to offer its support and I'm afraid everybody on the executive of the board is in Port Hawkesbury today, almost everybody. Uh, so I, I came, I offered to, to come to represent the board today. With respect to are there other uh, areas uh, looking at this, I can speak personally for the area in which I live um, that I'm supportive, that we are hopeful in our area, most of us. We don't have unanimity. And, you know, it was mentioned earlier about uh, by a couple of the members, um, you know, through the consultation process and all that. If we're looking for unanimity, you're never going to find it. It's not going to, there's too many people, but uh, I like to quote uh, um, Voltaire. I guess says, "Don't let uh, don't let perfection be the enemy of good or better." Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation. Oh, you wanted for the, okay, Mr. John. Sorry, Mr. No, John. Not at all. <laughs> Sorry. Thank you, and uh, it's uh, for me. It's such a culture shift. It's it's nice to see the comments that you're making in regards to modernization of municipalities across the province. I think that uh, it, I'm I'm very glad to see that municipalities are coming to the realization that they can maintain their identity while still serve service their residents at a more cost efficient, uh, you know, be more effective and cost efficient. Um, one of the, I'm just curious if one of the comments that are here, if you could uh, elaborate on on some examples for me. It's uh, in regards to there need to be new tools available to help with uh, over the 
Instead of the Municipal Government Act being too flexible, there needs to be new tools available to help them improve. Can you give me some suggestions of ideas or tools that the NSFM have discussed that would be beneficial to look at? I Mr. Can't Cantwell. Give, thank you, Madam Chair. I uh, can't give you them that we discussed specifically at the board uh, or at the membership, but uh, ones that we have looked at from the uh, from the area from which I uh, I hail, Kings County, and we have, and we find those uh, added tools are um, well certainly mentioned, and and not that the board hasn't discussed this, but nothing specific for today. But it's the regional, uh, and we talked about this earlier. The uh, things like planning documents; those are uh, those. That's a tool to allow for more regional cooperation. I see uh, intermunicipal uh, service arrangements and agreements being a big part of the tools that we'll have to uh, that we could use. Um, the public consultation is uh, and communication is the key to it all, uh, and it, it would be developed through the. Um, uh, developed through the process, making sure that the citizens, those who are going to be affected by any uh, any change in governance, is uh, are kept well informed. All right, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Sure. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> we re okay, we're reverting back to Bill Number Fifty Eight. Um, I call Victor Olton and Henry Vissers, please. Thank you for coming. And you're, are you both presenting? Okay. Mr. Olton? I don't get called that very often, so oh, be careful. Well, enjoy so. it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not called Madam Chair very often, okay. especially at home. <laughs> well, I'm Victor Olton. Uh, I have a, we have a farm in the, in the West Hance area, actually, that was just being talked about here, but that's irrelevant to this conversation, but uh, uh, the farm with my, my dad, my brother, and their families. Uh, I currently serve a term as president of the Federation of Agriculture, and would like to thank the Law of Amendments Committee for having given us this opportunity uh, to present on the proposed changes of the Municipal Government Act, Bill 58. Protecting agriculture land has been a key priority for farmers across Nova Scotia. Land is essential to agriculture, and once it's lost to development, it can never be recovered. Here in Nova Scotia, we are fortunate to have one point, a little over one and a half million hectares of agriculture class soil, of which almost 30%, which is almost 30% of our land that is suitable for agriculture production. While a portion of this land, although incalculable, has been lost to urban development, what remains is vital to the future of our industry. When we think of agriculture land, we immediately think of food and lots of fields and crops, maple groves and Christmas trees, but agriculture land is, is much more than these. Agriculture land contributes to the livelihoods of more than 2,400 farm families across Nova Scotia and their employees. Agriculture land is a rural economic driver. Nearly 600 million dollars of gross farm income is generated each year in Nova Scotia from agriculture land. This gross farm income creates over 9,000 jobs on farm as well as indirectly supporting industries like machinery, feed stores, construction and many more. Agriculture land creates scenic landscapes which yield agritourism opportunities. Agritourism generates economic opportunities for communities. People from around the world come to see our orchards, our vineyards, and our farm markets for the experience, the spin-off, or the spin-off from these experiences supports bed and breakfasts, local restaurants, and local artisans. Aside from economics of agriculture land, agriculture land encourages biodiversity, which creates habitat for wildlife and plant species. Not all air available agriculture land is currently in use. There are several factors that play 
to play into this inactive agriculture land. Abandonment may, may occur because there's no farm successor. Agriculture land values are on the rise. Sometimes farmers sell their land for development as a means for his retirement or her retirement. There are lots of farm lands that are forested. Though this land is inactively farmed and maybe not even main, maintained, the land is still available for future farmers. Land has always been important to farmers. Over the last couple of years, the Nova Scotia Federation of Agriculture brought together stakeholders to work on recommendations outlined in government papers to preserve agriculture land in Nova Scotia. It goes without saying that preserving agriculture land is a multifaceted issue, which, inclu which includes land taxation, protection, and planning. The committee is working on developing, developing a provincial land strategy for agriculture land use in Nova Scotia. An agriculture land policy must have an authentic statement around agriculture land use and protection. <clears throat> Therefore, and further include transfer of land, accessing land, land bank, taxation, registration, and migration. Changes to the Municipal Government Act to make mandatory, to make planning mandatory across all municipalities are welcome and support the work of the Nova Scotia Federation of Agriculture's Land Policy Committee. With regards to the addition of the regulation development identified in section uh, 214, subsection 4A, in the event that regulations with regards to the to the planning of agriculture land are developed, the NSFA would like to be part of the consultation process and inform, and inform from an industry perspective. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today. Thank you, Mr. Holton. Uh, Ms. Zan. Thank you very much. Could you um, please explain, so are you in favor of these changes, the amendments, or are you hoping to, to have more consultation? No, we are in favor of the of uh, having a uh, mandatory planning. Okay, thank you very much. Yes. I just want to be clear on yep. that. Thank you. Any further questions? Oh, Mr. Irving. Uh, thank you, Victor. Um, uh, I appreciate you coming here, and I think that one of the most important reasons for this legislation is for his issues such as you've brought forward here. Uh, the statements of provincial interest not applying to such a large, large land base uh, in this province because there is no uh, planning in many rural municipalities uh, uh, is important. And I appreciate your uh, comment about consultations on changes to the statements of provincial interest, and I'm working with the minister on that, as you are aware, and there's every intention, even though a consultation has has been conducted some years ago. A further consultation with the Federation uh, will be sought and your input taken into account. But uh, again, thank you for lending your voice to mandatory planning uh, for the province. I think it's an important step forward, uh, not only for agriculture, but floodplain infrastructure, those mm -hmm. other statements of provincial interest. So uh, it's key and thank you for appearing today. Thank you, Mr. Hilton. Any further questions? Well, thank you for coming today. Thank you. Uh, uh, if you flip over your sheets, members, um, there are a few more bills. Is that it? No, I'm here. So we, we okay. haven't dealt with the resolutions on, on any bill. Okay. Okay. On the, the numerical order, but then you're back and forth. Okay, so on the advice of Ledge Council, we will um, go back to uh, Bill Number 58 and um, entertain any. Oh, Mr. John. Uh, yes. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. So, would this be the time that a uh, a motion would come forward if there was an amendment then? Yes. For 58? Okay. Um, thank you very much, Madam Chair. And I guess uh, what I would do, uh, I would like to move that uh, 
uh, as per the presentation by John Trace with the Halifax Regional Municipality, that uh, removal from the bill of any amendments to the HRM Charter at this time. Um, I would I would suggest that although someone may say that uh, argue in regards to consistency across uh, the province, I guess what I would suggest, uh, similar to uh, the arguments I made with CBRM in the legislature last time we sat, uh, the reason that HRM has a, a charter is to recognize its uniqueness in the province and uh, as Mr. Traves uh, suggested here that uh, this current uh, piece of legislation would actually tie their hands somewhat having uh, the province overstep them. So uh, I think that, uh, you know, his, his points in regards to his submission that uh, um, amendments to the HRM Charter would probably be more appropriate uh, when they look at all the other amendments that are coming forward as well. So uh, based on that, I would put forward the amendment that we would remove from the bill, any amendments to the HRM Charter? Any discussion? Oh, Mr. Irving? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, uh, I don't think that uh, I can support uh, where you're going with that. I think there is an uh, important element of consistency that, that all our municipalities are, are working with a consistent uh, piece of legislation uh, with respect to planning. I. I uh, heard the uh, concerns by HRM Council, um, the idea that the minister is responsible for uh, making regulations and uh, being concerned about not being consulted. Uh, ministers make regulations uh, constantly in government. It's, it has been the uh, pr uh, practice um, by municipal affairs to consult with municipalities and, and, and in particular consult with HRM as our, our largest uh, uh, municipality. Um, the track record is there with respect to those consultations recently, the Joint Municipal Accountability and Transparency regs uh, were consulted. I, I see uh, no reason uh, uh, to hold this bill up uh, because ministers consult and, and make regulations uh, in a whole variety of ways. I think it's important to understand that uh, uh, the province delegates the responsibility to planning to our municipalities, um, but the province continues to have an interest, uh, as we've talked about with respect to agricultural land, preservation, flooding. These all, uh, many of these issues come back to the province with respect to uh, provincial ta uh, taxes with respect, you know, we just had an announcement today of a CBRM receiving funding uh, for the flooding relief. Uh, so, uh, of course, Ms., uh, the province has, uh, ha has an interest uh, and something to say and a reason to consult and, and uh, oversee issues which are uh, in, our, in our interest uh, provincially. Um, the concern uh, also raised with respect to uh, fines, I, 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 I think uh, uh, the, the lawyer, of course, was being lawyerish and saying, well, what about this could actually happen? I think the, you know, the real intent of, of, of those fines, again, consistency around the province, that we have uh, an ability um, to get all municipalities uh, to plan uh, uh, the carrot and the stick. Um, to get those that plan without, uh, within a reasonable time frame, uh, I think this is a tool. The the idea of fines that uh, once we we get a reasonable time frame in consultation with municipalities, that's when fines would be uh, would be uh, in, in, uh, implemented. Um, so I think that is uh, to give some teeth to the legislation to make sure that those that don't have plans in place, uh, get them in place in a reasonable time frame and that we're not uh, uh, sitting with an empty piece of legislation and, and no new plans in place, uh, you know, a number of years from now. Uh, so with that, I, I think it's uh, incumbent upon us to put this legislation through uh, and uh, encourage uh, Minister and all departments to continue with uh, uh, meaningful consultation with municipalities. Thank you, Madam Chair. Ms. Martin. Ooh. Thank you, um, Madam Chair. And so, if I could be clear on what my colleague um, 
in the PCs have said, um, and I, re I think I remember when a one of item was brought up about the CBRM, that there was that there was much discussion about CBRM shouldn't be treated any differently. That it, we're a province and we sh all should be treated equally. And to that end, I believe that if there is a specific issue pertaining to a specific area of the province, I believe that we can deal with it as we did with CBRM during the last session. We needed to pass legislation to move forward um, something that would benefit the CBRM, but at no point do I think HRM should be excluded. Um, they're the largest municipality in the province. CBRM is the second largest municipality. Where will we stop? So, you know, I think we, de we d deal with the one ofs when they come up and that if legislation is going to be in place for all municipalities, then I believe legislation is going to be in place for all municipalities. Thank you. Mr. Mr. Johns. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and I, uh, if I could, uh, just to address uh, uh, MLA Martin's uh, uh, comments, I believe when uh, the issues around CBRM came up, that our caucus argued at the time that uh, amendments shouldn't happen uh, to the entire province. Uh, CBRM should have a charter, which they don't have, and that, that those changes would then, f because that charter would recognize the uniqueness of CBRM, and at that time that was more of a uh, the way that the, the changes should have been made versus affecting the whole province. And uh, certainly not to be argumentative, but on the, on the motion uh, uh, to MLA uh, Irving, I would suggest that, and, and I'll have to go back and check Hansard, but I, I, I find it somewhat ironic. I believe what you're saying today is very, uh, is almost totally the opposite of what you said in the House last sitting when we were discussing bonus bonus density planning for HRM at the time. And uh, at that time, our caucus suggested that uh, bonus density and, and expansion of that may not necessarily be a beneficial thing. And I believe, and, and like I said, I will consult Hansard, and, and if so, make sure that I uh, raise it if, if the motion's unsuccessful here, I'll make sure that I raise it at the uh, committee at whole house and third reading. But I believe uh, at that time you suggested that it, it was beneficial and uh, so, so it almost seems like I'm hearing two separate things last session and something else this session, but I'll confirm it and uh, certainly bring it forward if this motion doesn't pass today. Thank you. Any further? Oh, Mr. Irving? Uh, not to get into the debate here, maybe we can do it in the House, but uh, that previous debate was with respect to uh, granting some tools to HRM in, in a more consistent basis throughout HRM. So I think this is quite different. What we're talking about here is provincial interest, the ability uh, that, you know, what's important here is planning is done in a consistent way, uh, overarching planning, planning framework, ensure that those planning documents are there so that the province's interests can be insured uh, throughout the province. And, and again, I, I, I think it's important that we uh, uh, recognize that the presentation from HRM said this uh, legislation doesn't change anything that they've been doing or, or what they will be doing forward. Their nervousness was around ministers being able to make regulations and I, as I've argued that is commonplace and common practice and uh, you know for instance the minister may be making changes in regulation to the statements of provincial interest on agriculture to strengthen it. Um, the idea of delegating those provincial interests uh, to HRM or, or having that not apply um, I think it's somewhat cumbersome to, to try and pack changes uh, to provincial interests uh, as, as we begin to learn more, uh, whether that's agricultural land protection or, or coastal protection would be another interest of the province to bring forward and having all the municipalities under one legislative framework is I think what we're trying to achieve here. Thank you, Madam Chair. Okay. Okay. Uh, there's an amendment on the floor. All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? No. Okay. The amendment is defeated. 
Um, is there a motion for this to be sent back to the House? Mr. Irving. Uh, Madam Chair, I move that uh, Bill Number 58, uh, an act to amend Chapter 18 of the Acts of 1998, the Municipal Government Act, and Chapter 39 of the Acts of 2008, the Halifax Regional Charter, be referred back to the House without amendment. All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Okay. The motion passes. The bill will be reported back to the House without amendment. Moving on to Bill Number 49, the Gaming Control Act. Um, Mr. Dontremont. Uh, thank you very much. Um, this is a bill, I think, when we first looked at it, I, I can say we were supportive of it. I, I still think we are, but I'm not sure after um, the presentations we just had. Um, I was trying to figure out, I mean, I understand maybe why Miss Burge was here, but I couldn't figure out why Mr. Kelly or Mr. Or Madam Weeb was here. I couldn't understand. I mean, it's great to have experts come and present before us, uh, but what's their interest in this? Why, why would they come to Nova Scotia, be aware of a bill, number 49, uh, to come all this way to present before us? And looking at the names, I mean, we have uh, one Nova Scotian, when Mr. Uh, Mr. Roberts from Casino Nova Scotia. Uh, we had Mr. Bernie Walsh, who has been a advocate for um, uh, uh, problem gambling for, for, for many, many years. Um, he wasn't on the list to present. So after consulting with media and others, and apparently they, they declared it outside, uh, that, that Mr. Kelly and Miss, and Miss, Miss Weeb and I believe Miss Burge was brought here by the uh, Nova Scotia Gaming Corporation. Um, so they were actually paid for uh, by our taxpayers' dollars to come present before us uh, as, as experts. Um, that concerns me a little bit when the Nova Scotia Gaming Corp uh, basically is here to make money for Nova Scotians. They're, they're there to take as much money uh, from gaming to flow it into uh, the, 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 the coffers of Nova Scotians, of Nova Scotia government. So. As much as these are experts, I, I really have to consider, you know, why uh, Gaming Corp was so interested in bringing these people here and presenting this particular uh, uh, self-exclusion program or uh, the method of exclusion, uh, self-exclusion. Um, I just, I, 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 like I said, I find it a little, a little bit of smoke and mirrors here of why Gaming Corp would try to uh, present this kind of game in front of this this committee. Um, so I'm just wondering if there be any way that we could, or I, I move that we hold this, can we stand this bill uh, so that we can consider this further? So my motion is, can we stand this bill at least until next meeting? Ms. Zan. Thank you very much. And to be honest, I would have to concur with our PC colleagues on this. Um, that was going to be my next question, which I never got to, which was who's paying you to be here? Are you being paid? Um, why are you here from all across Canada? So this answers that question. The other thing is I really would have liked to have heard from the Canadian Mental Health Association or Addictions Services to see what they have to say about this. It's kind of like trying to make a decision in the dark, blindfolded. Uh, we don't hear what they have to say. And again, as somebody who has dealt with addictions myself, I'd love to hear some of the experts from that perspective and hear what they have to say about whether this is something that will help or hinder or do nothing. Uh, so I, I would love to see this stood as well. And uh, maybe we could have some more consultation, bring somebody else in to speak to us to this bill. Ms. De Sandos. The no, amendment was open for anybody to come. If they were against it, they would have showed up. I, we didn't see anybody who actually came in against this uh, move. Uh, it's been a, a positive move for for many people that that I know. Anyway, the person I know. So I'm not sure. Mr. John. Yes. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I think, uh, you know, I, d I support uh, the amendment before us, if for nothing else that, you know, we make informed decisions in the optics. Uh, I mean, it, I'm confused as uh, the members to my left and right, why we had nobody here from Gamblers Anonymous, why we, we had nobody local and respectfully uh, 
very respectfully to the gentleman from the casino because uh, I do believe he was here uh, for all the right reasons but somebody could certainly make an accusation while well, he works with the casino and he's here to promote uh, the casino and I, and I don't believe that at all for, for him. I do believe he was sincere but the optics are the deck, deck here is somewhat stacked and uh, I, you know I think that regardless of party politics, partisan politics aside, we need to make sure that we do what is best for Nova Scotians and especially for vulnerable members of, of Nova Scotia. And, and I'm not feeling really confident that, uh, and, and I felt perfectly fine walking in here today in all honesty, prior to listening to the speakers who spoke in favor of this. So now I'm not, now I'm wondering what the, the hidden agenda is because I feel like there's something up so I certainly support the motion to stay this till we can have a better discussion. Ms. Martin. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I completely agree with my colleagues to the left of me who have said it should be stood down. Um, absolutely, it's open for people to come, but perhaps if we had paid them to come as the ones who spoke in favor of it, they would have come as well. Mr. Dantremont. Well, and to the point is that uh, I know we tend to meet at three o'clock on Mondays, but you know I, I'm, I'm going to ask: When did the notice go out that we had a law amendments booked for today? Um, I can tell you, I didn't get notice until later on on Friday. So you know, how did anyone know? You know, if they're busy, they can't get themselves free to be here. So you know, there's a, if you're paid to be here, sure you're going to be here. If you don't know what things are going on, you got to make your own arrangements. Well, then you might not be here. So, just it's a concern uh, that I that you know there, there should be no reason why we can't stand this for at least until sometimes this week we can call another meeting forward to give us an opportunity to go back and look at something here because it does worry me that we didn't hear from certain groups. Okay, Mr. Jessam. I just, Madam Chair, through you, I'm just seeking clarification from the members opposite. Um, are your concerns about the content of the bill? Um, and I, 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 I'll be, I'll speak frankly. I, uh, you know, when you're talking about moving the yardstick in in such a way that takes away, uh, I guess, a permanent, a permanent ban in this case um, as a as a tool, um, it's kind of counterintuitive that. In, in, at least, at least the way I looked at it initially, um, and when I when I heard the rationale around trying to make this a program that's more accessible for a variety of, of Nova Scotians and, and people that are considering um, uh, self, uh, not self-identifying, but self-exclusion, uh, um, it, it kind of made, it made practical sense to me. So I just wanted to clarify through the, through the chair, are the members against the content of the bill? Mr. Dantremont. Thank you, and uh, to, to the honourable member, it, it, it's simply, you know, we are a committee for consultation. Right? We, we, we are supposed to listen to people to make sure that the bills are coming before us are appropriate, and if they're not appropriate, that we should amend them if that needs to happen. Um, I, just, I just feel uneasy, and not, and not for any political reason, just the, face, the, the, the fact that NS, the Nova Scotia Gaming Corporation paid for these individuals to come here and locals didn't have an opportunity to come here for some reason. So maybe they can, maybe they didn't want to come, maybe they're supportive of it, I don't know. My, my first glance at this bill was supportive uh, because I believe that we should make adjustments uh, for best practice, which is kind of what this does. But finding out they were paid for by Nova Scotia Gaming Corporation just puts a whole bunch of, please don't accept this as, as being political, but a couple red flags up that I'm just concerned that I need to do a little more research on this before I, I let it go. I mean, there's other opportunities to, in the process, but you know, at, at the very least, let's see if we can hold it here for a couple of days until we consult. Ms. Ann, sorry, Ms. Ann. Thank you. Um, yes, I would like to have it stood until we can all, till the the committee can hear from, you know, the Gambling Anonymous or the Canadian Mental Health Association, some of these groups who work with people with addictions, who uh, who know the facts, who know the statistics. Some of the gentlemen didn't know the answers to the questions that I was asking. Perhaps I was asking the wrong one, but um, 
I'd like to hear from the people who actually work in the trenches with people who have the problem to hear whether or not they feel that this is a good bill to pass, whether the amendment will make any difference whatsoever. Um, and I too was very concerned when I started to see that most of the people who were presenters were from other provinces where they already have this in place. And I'm wondering, so is their company profiting from this? They work for a company. Is it profiting from them putting this into every province? Um, I just, my, my spidey senses are going up and my, I keep thinking, follow the money. Um, I'd like, to, I'd like to hear more from the people who actually are working with the people with the problems, not the people who are working for the company that is making the money and helping casinos to make more money. Mr. John. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. And, and I guess I find it somewhat interesting. I, I raised some, and, and there are members on this committee that sit with me on the Human Resources Committee as well. And uh, this is the second time that uh, our caucus has raised concerns in regards to things that the government is doing or, or things that are recommendations that are before us. And both times we've come forward and said the optics for government is not good in some of these things. Now, I know I'm going to go back to my caucus office and get slapped by, by staff for uh, defending government and not taking the opportunity to uh, get in the media and, and, and be opposition. But I, I do think that, uh, you know, we want to, or at least I would like to see that we, we come with the best legislation that is going to best reflect the needs of Nova Scotians and those vulnerable people um, that, that this affects. And I don't feel that this committee currently, I, I recognize the report that uh, came forward, although three of the presenters today were somehow involved with that report or at an arm's length of the company that did that report. I don't think the optics are that great for this. So I would caution once again and, and, and hopefully the, the government members will, uh, will support and stay this until a later time. Thank Ms. you. Ms. Martin, and this will be the last. Thank you, Madam Chair. And to, uh, in response to MLA um, Jessam's question, I, I think it's only in, it's incumbent on us. We're not disagreeing, I don't think, from what I understand from my colleagues, that we're disagreeing with the premise of this bill. What we're disagreeing with, that is on Friday at 4 o'clock when we, I received notice that law amendments was called back, um, if you have somebody traveling from BC that you're paying to come and testify, um, that happened relatively quick, in my opinion, to find out Friday afternoon um, and to be here to present. And as, as uh, my colleagues to the left have said, those that haven't been paid, were they offered the same, the same opportunities? You know, we heard all of the pro for this bill to pass, and everybody um, is is suspect to receive a, a financial benefit from this. And I don't think that we're doing any due diligence to the residents of Nova Scotia by only hearing from those people. We need to stand this bill down and we need to give those vulnerable communities ample time to show up. If nobody shows up, then so be it. But we need to work together in order to allow everybody to speak, not just those who are being paid to speak. Okay, so there is an amendment on the floor. Oh, Mr. Mr. Irving. Uh, th thank you, Madam Chair. And, and I, th I think uh, uh, the, the process now being uh, presented from our members opposite uh, go contrary to the processes of this committee that have been used uh, presumably for decades here. The, the idea that, uh, well, we just didn't, haven't heard the other side of the story or somebody was paid to be here, I think we have been at this table numerous times in which we haven't heard the other side of the story or union representatives or whatever were paid to be here. Um, you know, you could look back at, at numerous bills here and say, well, why, wasn't, why didn't we hear the other side of the story here? Well, may, I think, you know, where I rest my decision on this is I believe that we have the evidence to make the decision. Uh, if you, as uh, my colleague uh, MLA Dontremont has indicated, there are other steps in the process uh, for you to bring new information. 
but I think if we are going to, at every opportunity, say, well, we don't have enough information, we haven't had another side, uh, I think that uh, has taken place for many bills before this committee, and to uh, uh, c consistently stand bills, uh, uh, I, I don't think uh, uh, helps us uh, move legislation through the House. I, I, th I suspect that uh, there could very easily be unanimous support on this. If, if in the next few days you are able to find people that want to give some insight, I'm sure you'll come to the House and, and share that. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Mr. Dontremont. Well, there you go. Um, I know how this is all going to turn out. Uh, you know, I'm trying to be non-political on this. Uh, I'm concerned about it, but I will. I will. My final statement, because I know how this is going to go, is you know the government has put their hands in this for one reason or another by paying for people to come present before us. It's shady. It's not right. We should have the opportunity to hear from other people before we go forward with this. With this, but. You know, if, if that's how it's going to work from now on, that government wants to pay for people to come present, I guess that's the way it's going to be from now on. So that's the precedence that's actually happening here, is that you guys are okay with people being paid to come here and present before us. It's been admitted outside, uh, outside that they were paid for by the Nova Scotia Gaming Corporation. And the last time I checked, there's a minister responsible for it. It goes straight to cabinet. I'm sorry. Uh, that's what it's doing. It's, it's a shame. You know, we tried to be nice on this one, but let's call it what it is. Uh, you, 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 you smoked it, and I guess we're all going to have to put up with it. So, question, please. Are there any further comments? Oh, uh, there, a recess has been called. Thank you. We will come to order, and there is a motion on the floor. Would you like to repeat it, please, the motion? Mr. Dontremont. Thank you. Uh, just simply to uh, stand uh, bill number 49 uh, until the next meeting. All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Aye. Motion is defeated. Um, okay. So now we have to move, a, a motion has to be made to move the bill. Mr. Irving. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Madam Chair, I bill, uh, move that Bill Number 49, an act to amend Chapter 4 of the Acts of 1994-95, the Gaming Control Act, be referred back to the House without amendment. All those in favour? Aye. Opposed? Nay. Motion is carried. Bill, Bill. I, I guess it's not, it's irrelevant, but I put it in. Bill number 55. 
Is there a motion? Ms. Mr. Irving. Thank you, Madam Chair. Madam Chair, I move that Bill Number 55 an act to incorporate the region of Windsor and West Hans Municipality be referred back to the House without amendment. So, oh, Mr. Donjamon, you voting? Mm -hmm. All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? The motion is carried. Bill number 55 will be reported back to the House without amendment. Uh, on the other side? Okay. Bill number 39, the Cemetery and Funeral Service Act. Mr. Dontremont. Uh, thank you. Uh, the clerk uh, has passed around an amendment uh, that was brought forward. If you remember from our last meeting, uh, we had Mr. Bennett that came before us to discuss um, how the system didn't work for he and his family after his uh, wife had been uh, cremated after her death uh, against their wishes. And there's a bit of a mix up in bodies. Um, so this is a discussion that we've had with the, uh, the minister responsible, uh, as well as the, uh, I think the premier mentioned uh, we're interested in bringing this forward from, uh, from Mr. Lohr, uh, I think had brought this one forward. So, so basically it's to allow uh, family and interested people that when something's being heard, uh, that they're able to stay in the meeting and hear the response. Uh, in, in the previous model, you could make a presentation to the board, uh, but you could not hear uh, the other side of the story. Uh, apparently, according to Mr. Bennett, he was actually heralded out of the meeting. So, uh, the the, uh, the uh, amendment you see before us, LAC PC-1, uh, is page 3, add after clause 9. 10, chapter 144 is further amended by adding immediately after section 14 the following sections. 14A, bylaws made by the board pursuant to section 14 must permit the board persons making a complaint and persons about whom a complaint is made to, A, be represented by counsel at the hearing of complaints, and B, hear and question all evidence presented. 14B, bylaws made by the board pursuant to section 14 must provide that A, both the person making the complaint and the person about whom the complaint is being made, or is made but may be present. B, the testimony of witnesses must be under oath, and C, participation by witnesses and other than their examination or cross-examination is at the discretion of the chairman of the board and then renumber the clauses 10 to 16 as 11 to 17. And I so move um, those amendments. So there's amendment on the floor. Is there any discussion? Oh, Mr. Irving. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I wonder if the honourable member who's proposed this uh, amendment can inform us whether this has been discussed with the sponsoring minister or anyone else uh, before it became here, because this clearly didn't come out of the law amendment process and hearing from, uh, from uh, citizens. Mr. Dantema. Uh, thank you. Um, no, this particular amendment has not been shared at this point with uh, the minister that I'm aware of. Um, of course, this is Mr. Lohr's, uh, Mr. Lohr's work as well, so um, I don't think it's been directly with him, but then again, we found out of the meeting again on Friday at 4 o'clock, so I, I don't know if there was enough time to present that to, uh, to the appropriate minister. Any further? Mr. Irving? Thank you for that, uh, MLA Dontremont. Uh, I would suggest that it might be a bit premature for us to deal with in uh, bringing this forward uh, during uh, Committee of the Whole by Mr. Lohr so that he can speak to it, I think has some merit. And so my suggestion here is that uh, uh, we do not uh, do this amendment here at this committee, but deal with it at Committee of the Whole in the, in the House. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Okay, there's an amendment on the floor. Any further? Ms. Dan. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Speaker or Madam Chair. While um, I appreciate the amendments from the member to my left, uh, we haven't had a chance to go over them with our caucus, so we'd like to be able to go over them with our caucus at this point. Mr. Dantemont. 
in this new era of consult, of consult, consult and working together, I will withdraw my motion uh, to be debated and discussed in our respective caucuses, and I'll have Mr. John, uh, uh, Mr. Mr. Lohr, uh, take that back uh, and talk to the minister as well. So I will withdraw uh, my motion. Is there unanimous consent to have the motion, the amendment withdrawn? Agreed. Yes. Agreed. Okay. It is withdrawn. Um, would someone like Mr. Jessen? Through you, Madam Chair, I move that Bill 39, the Cemetery and Funeral Services Act amended and the Embalmers and Funeral Directors Act amended be returned to the House uh, without amendment. Um, all those in favour? Opposed? Um, the bill carries. Uh, the motion carries, and I move that Bill Number 39 report back to the House without amendment. Number fifth, Bill Number 51, the Halifax Convention Centre Act. Mr. John. Uh, yes, thank you, Madam Chair, and I would uh, move that page one, clause three, be deleted. And for members of the committee, that was uh, the clause that uh, removed the requirement for the corporation to make an annual report on uh, every year on the convention center. And uh, if I could, Madam Chair, as a past board member of the of the Halifax C Convention Center, you know, I will certainly attest that uh, one of the things I look forward to every year was uh, the AGM and the, the presentation of the annual report. And, uh, you know, certainly given the past criticisms uh, by some across this uh, province in regards to uh, the project and the significant amount of uh, public commitment that's gone into this, this project, I think that, uh, you know, once again we're back to optics, the optics of uh, not having to present a annual uh, an annual report. I, I just don't feel that that's right. I think that the uh, the public does have a, uh, a right to know how the convention center is doing and, and uh, have that annual report. And you know, I find it particularly ironic uh, last week being the right to know week that, uh, that we're here today uh, looking at this. So I would uh, move for open and transparency and uh, look to delete clause three. Okay, any more further discussion? Uh, Mr. Irving. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I, I believe annual reports uh, have, have been used in the past. Uh, again, uh, similar to the previous amendment, uh, this isn't coming forward from any requests from anybody at HRM or anybody at the meeting here today, so I would suggest that, uh, further consideration of this should be at uh, Committee of the Whole, and I would uh, uh, recommend that uh, uh, we not consider this at this time, that these amendments can be dealt with at Committee of the Whole. Any further discussion? Mr. John. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. And like I said, I think that uh, the motion that's before the committee is, is pretty straightforward. Um, you know, that the uh, corporation would have to present a, uh, an annual, uh, annual report. I think that uh, that you know, almost even Nova Scotia Power and, and other uh, entities, they all present a, uh, annual reports. I, I think it's, uh, I think at the end of this uh, sitting, what the, the government's going to be remembered for is uh, appointing uh, friends who make political contributions, paying presenters, and hiding uh, AG, hiding reports from the public. And, uh, you know, I, I don't think that's that's something that this government really wants to be seen as, but so far we've got two, so it'll be interesting to see. So I'd call for the vote. Any further discussion? Mm. There's an amendment on the floor. All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Motion is defeated. Amendment is defeated. Is there a motion to move the bill? Mr. Jessen. Just, just bear with me for one sec there, Madam Chair. All right. A move that Bill 51, Halifax Convention Center Act amended, be uh, re referred back to the House with an amendment. Uh, 
Um, there's a motion. All those in favor? Opposed? The motion carries. Bill number 30, 39 will be reported back to the House without amendment. Fif Wasn't it 39? 51. 51, sorry. You said 30. <laughs> sorry. Um, okay, so we move to number bill number 63, the Nova Scotia Provincial Exhibition Commission Act. No change sheets. Mr. Irving. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I move that Bill Number 63, the Nova Scotia Provincial Exhibition Commission Act, uh, repealed, be uh, referred back to the House without amendment. Uh, Ms. Zan. Thank you. Um, I would just like it to be on the record that uh, at this point, uh, repealing this act uh, takes away any responsibility from any community uh, involvement in the Nova Scotia Provincial Exhibition Commission, which happens in Truro. And I have expressed my concern to the minister that there's no, um, there is no reference to the Truro Raceway in this new repealed, in the new act, since it's repealed. Um, and so I have his word that the Truro Raceway will in fact continue to exist, but yet there is nothing now on the books. So with that, I'd just like to record that I have concerns about this going forward, but I have his word, whatever that is worth, that the Truro Raceway will be um, protected on a, on a going forward basis. Noted, Ms. Zane. Thank you. Any further remarks or questions? Okay, all those in favor? Aye. Opposed? The motion is carried and that bill number 63 will be reported back to the House without amendment. Bill number 67, the Securities Act. Is there a motion? Mr. Irving. <coughs> Thank you, Madam Chair. Madam Chair, I move that Bill Number 67, the Securities Act Amendment, be referred back to the House without amendment. Are there any remarks, questions? Okay. Um, all those in favor? Opposed? The motion is carried. Bill Number 67 will be reported back to the House without amendment. Being no further business, I adjourn this meeting of the Law Amendments Committee. Thank you all.